This happened to me a few years ago, down in the Louisiana Bayou. Not the kind of place most folks visit, especially not alone. Me, though, I like the quiet. Did some freelance IT work, could do it from anywhere. Figured I'd spend a few weeks in a little cabin out there, get away from the city, reconnect with nature, that kind of thing. My name's Harris, by the way. First few days went fine. I fished in the swamp, did some hiking on the old trails, saw some gators, bunch of weird birds, nothing too out of the ordinary. Then, one evening, I was sitting on the porch when I heard it, howling coming from deeper in the woods. Not a coyote, not anything I recognized. Sounded bigger, deeper, with an edge to it that made my neck hairs stand up. Figured it must be some kind of big dog from a nearby farm, got loose. Didn't think much of it. Next morning, I went for a walk, found a deer carcass picked clean not too far from the cabin. Okay, that was unsettling, but big predators are a fact of life out there. Told myself it was probably a bear, though something about how the bones were cracked seemed wrong. That night, I didn't sleep much. The howls were back, closer this time. And there was another sound too, kind of a shuffling, like something big moving around the cabin. I flipped on the porch light, peered out, but didn't see anything. Told myself I was getting spooked by nothing, but I propped a chair against the door for good measure. The next few days I stayed close to the cabin. Figured whatever was out there would move on eventually but the noises persisted, getting bolder. I started catching glimpses of movement at the edge of the woods. Hard to make out, but big, hunched, not moving like any animal I knew. Fear was starting to gnaw at me, the kind that sits in your gut. Then came the night that changed everything. I was sitting inside, trying to read, when I heard a bang against the window. Jumped out of my skin, at the window I saw it, pressed right up against the glass. A huge, hairy face, wolf-like but twisted somehow, the snout too long, the eyes glowing yellow. I backed away, heart thundering. It pounded at the glass a few more times, then backed off, disappearing into the darkness. I spent the rest of the night huddled in a corner, old shotgun from the cabin closet in my lap. Knew I wouldn't get any more sleep. First light, I packed my things. I had to get out of there. I didn't know what the thing was, but I wasn't sticking around to find out. Ran to my truck, started it up, and peeled out down the dirt track leading back towards the highway. Glanced in the rearview mirror, and that's when I saw it come out of the trees. It was running at an impossible speed, Huge paws hitting the ground and long strides, closing in on the truck. I floored the gas pedal, swerving as it leaped, claws scraping the side of the truck. I thought I'd lost it, but then heard the thud as it landed on the roof. Metal shrieked as it dug in. I swerved wildly, trying to throw it off, but it held on. Heard a window shatter, then a snarl right above me. A hairy arm snaked inside, flailing. I grabbed the shotgun, fired a wild shot upwards. It roared, and the weight on the roof was gone. I didn't stop driving until I hit a small town, hours away. Went straight to the sheriff's office, babbling about the creature in the swamp. Sheriff looked at me like I'd lost my mind. Didn't press charges or anything but the amused glances from his deputies, that was almost worse. Got out of the bayou, never went back. Took me a long time to sleep soundly again. Folks think I'm crazy, maybe I am a little. But they don't know what's lurking out there, in the shadows. Some things defy explanation. I started looking into old Cajun folklore later, stories of the Ruguru a kind of werewolf creature. Fits what I saw better than anything else. Whether it was a monster, a wild animal messed up somehow, 
or some backwoods lunatic in a costume, I don't know. All I know is that if I'd stayed in that cabin any longer, I wouldn't be here to tell the tale. This happened to me a few years back, on a trip to Arizona. People head to the Grand Canyon for the views, but you want real wildness, you go to the Mogollon Rim. I'm Jared, by the way, construction worker from Texas. At least I was before all this. Bit of a tough guy reputation, a bit of a beer gut, not exactly the scared rabbit type, you know? Truth is, that trip was meant to be me time. My wife had her sister's wedding to wrangle, and our anniversary kind of got forgotten. Hit the road instead of buying flowers. Classic bonehead move I won't be repeating any time soon. Figured I'd do some camping, find a place to fish and drink where nobody could tell me to turn down the classic rock. First two days went to plan. Found a sweet little spot on the edge of the Coconino National Forest. Far off the beaten path, surrounded by pines and blessedly quiet. Seemed like I had the whole place to myself. Then, the third night, that's when things got weird. I'd finished dinner, had a few beers, standard routine. Just as I was drifting off by the embers of the fire, I heard something. Snapping branches, heavy footfalls circling my camp. I sat up, hand near the hunting knife I'd been too lazy to put away. It sounded big, whatever it was. Bear maybe? We don't get those down south so much. Grabbed a burning branch, held it up like a torch. And that's when I saw it. For a second, just a second, it was caught in the firelight. Hunched over, but not on all fours. Too tall, limbs too long to be a bear. Shaggy black fur slipped close to its hide, and a head, not like any animal I'd ever seen. Muzzle long and lean, teeth shining, and eyes that glowed like embers themselves. Wolf? Something else? My brain didn't have the vocabulary for it. The fire sputtered, the thing was gone, vanished into the night. I barely slept, clutching that knife, campfire blazing as bright as I could make it. Come dawn, I wasn't taking chances. I packed up my gear quick as you like, half figuring I imagined the whole thing in a beer-fueled haze. Then I found the tracks. They weren't bare tracks, not cougar either. Big, clawed footprints, two legs, not four. Followed them for a while, pure stupidity driving me more than good sense. They led deep into the trees, away from any trail. For some idiotic reason— I still figured it could be explained away. Maybe someone's weird dog got loose? Yeah, sure, a dog the size of a linebacker. I was nearing one of those deep ravines the rim is famous for. I was thinking about turning back when I heard the yelling. A woman's voice, faint, cut off quick like someone put a hand over her mouth. My blood ran cold. Whatever was out there, it wasn't just some animal. Got to the edge of the ravine. Below there was an old logging trail, and there was a park ranger's truck pulled over. No sign of anybody at a glance. Then I saw her, young woman with a ponytail, ranger uniform, being dragged into the bushes by, by that thing. It was massive, at least seven feet tall, muscles rippling under that awful slick fur had her pinned down, jaws open, and in the light filtering through the trees, its teeth looked freakishly long, not like a dog's at all. I did something stupid. Something reckless. I yelled, ran towards them waving my arms like a maniac. I figured make noise, distract it, give her a chance. It worked, sort of. The creature whipped its head round, snarling. The woman scrambled up, bolted. I didn't see where she ran off to. 
All that was left was me and it, twenty feet between us. Those eyes narrowed, focused on me. It stood up straighter, and I swear, it almost seemed to be sizing me up. That's when I broke. I don't mean I cried or nothing dramatic. I mean something inside me just snapped clean in two. I turned and ran like I'd never run in my life. I heard it give chase, those awful loping strides gaining ground fast. The ravine, the trees, everything was a blur. Somehow, and I honestly don't know how, I got to the truck. Fumbled keys, got the engine started. The thing burst from the tree line, and for a frozen second, I looked into its eyes again, and I saw something behind them that chilled me worse than the hunger. Intelligence. Calculation. I slammed the truck in gear, peeling out in a shower of gravel. I didn't look back until I hit the main highway. No sign of the creature, no sign of the ranger woman, not a damned soul but me. Drove to the nearest town, told them everything. Search party went out, found nothing. Nobody believed me, course not. They wrote it off as a bear attack, maybe a mountain lion. Said the woman probably wandered off, injured and disoriented. Maybe she did, but I don't think so. This happened to me a couple of years ago. Sounds dumb, like one of those cheesy horror movies, but trust me, it wasn't. My name's Kellen. Outdoors a type, always have been. Hiking, camping, fishing, my happy place is out in the wilderness, far away from city noise and worries. Never had anything really bad happen before. Turns out, there's a first time for everything. This trip, I went solo. Needed some headspace. Chose a national forest in the Pacific Northwest. Thick woods, rugged terrain, supposed to be some killer trout streams up high. Figured it'd be good for the soul, even if the fishing sucked. First day was uneventful, mostly just getting my bearings, setting up camp near a lake. I'd done my research, knew the area was popular with day hikers, but figured I'd head further out where they wouldn't go. Day two, things started getting weird. I set off before dawn, aiming for a stream a few miles back. Trail was faint, overgrown, but hey, that's the point of adventure, right? Problem was, the deeper I went, the heavier the air felt. Not physically heavy, but like something was watching. I brushed it off at first, blamed it on being alone, my overactive imagination. Then I found the signs. Not obvious at first, took a trained eye to notice. A snapped branch, angled wrong. Tufts of fur caught on a bush, way too high up to be any normal animal. And this faint smell hanging on the breeze, hard to explain, but rotten meat mixed with something wild, an undercurrent of musk that pricked at the back of my neck. I stopped, every instinct screaming at me to go back. But that nagging hunter's pride kicked in. What the hell was scaring me, some overgrown deer? and those trout weren't going to catch themselves. So I pushed on, faster now, uneasy, yet somehow also more determined. It was late afternoon when I reached the stream. Damn thing was smaller than a creek back home, but I figured, worth a try. I cast my line, scanning the opposite bank. That's when I saw the eyes. They were on the ridge line, glinting in a patch of sunlight between the trees. Yellow, not like any animal I knew. And big. Way too far to make out details, but the way they stayed locked on me. I felt hunted, plain and simple. For a minute, we just stared at each other. Me, frozen on the stream bank. It, unmoving on the ridge. Then, it was gone, vanishing back into the trees. I stood there, 
heart pounding, trying to convince myself it was just the trick of the light, some hiker with a reflective jacket. But deep down, I knew I was lying to myself. I reeled in my line and ran. Didn't follow the trail, just scrambled up the nearest slope, branches tearing at my clothes. Fear fueled me, primal, irrational. Part of me kept expecting claws on my back, teeth in my neck, but it never came. Found my way back to camp at dusk, panting and scratched up, but in one piece. Night was worse than the day. Every rustle outside my tent was a potential threat. Every snap of a twig sent shivers down my spine. I barely slept, a hunting knife gripped in my hand for pathetic comfort. Come morning, I broke camp in record time. Didn't care about fishing, didn't care about looking like a wimp. I just wanted out. Hiked back double time, barely pausing to catch my breath. The feeling of being watched followed me, never quite fading. As I neared the trailhead, I started to relax a bit. Seeing other hikers, a couple families out for a picnic, it lulled me into a false sense of security. Big mistake. About a mile from the main parking lot, a movement off to the side caught my eye. It was half hidden behind a screen of leaves, but massive built like a bear but hunched over. And those eyes, yellow, unmistakable, boring into me from the shadows. I didn't even think, just dropped my pack and bolted. I could hear it crashing through the underbrush behind me, grunts that were too guttural to belong to any animal I knew. The trail ahead blurred with my panic-stricken tears. Then, a shout from ahead. A group of hikers, older guys with serious gear. They'd heard the commotion, turned just in time to see me burst out of the trees, something huge and dark on my heels. I didn't get a good look at it. Just the sheer bulk, the speed that defied its size, and those damn eyes. The hikers didn't hesitate. One pulled a rifle before I could even yell a warning. Two shots echoed through the forest. I stumbled to a halt, panting, barely able to speak. The hikers closed in, cautiously approaching the spot where the, the thing had been. They found nothing. No blood, no body, no sign at all that something inhuman had been lurking just steps off the trail. Just some trampled bushes and disturbed ground. I stammered out my story, the sense of being watched, the eyes on the ridge, the final chase. They listened, expressions a mix of pity and disbelief. Finally, the one in the lead, grizzled guy with kind eyes, spoke. Son, you had yourself a panic attack. Happens in the woods sometimes. Isolation gets to you. I wanted to yell, to argue, but what was the point? They hadn't seen the eyes, hadn't felt that wrongness hanging in the air. I ended up just nodding, going through the motions as they called the park rangers for me. The aftermath is what really messed me up. It wasn't just self-doubt, though there was plenty of that. It was the way everyone looked at me after, family, friends, even the damn ranger who took my statement. Like I was fragile, broken. No one said it outright, but the unspoken words hung in the air. Crazy hiker sees monsters in the woods. I tried to brush it off, get back to normal life. But normal wasn't there anymore. I'd walk down a city street and catch a flicker of movement in the alley shadows, my heart pounding like it would burst. Every time a dog barked at night, it sounded like that guttural growl echoing through the trees. Couldn't go hiking anymore, that was obvious but even a casual walk in the park felt fraught with unseen dangers. Then came the news reports. It started with a missing person. A solo camper in a national forest just a state over. His campsite torn apart, signs of a struggle, but no body. The description of the area, dense woods, rugged terrain, 
sent a chill down my spine. Then more reports, same pattern. People vanishing without a trace in the wilderness. The only clue sometimes a flash of yellow eyes glimpsed by a fellow hiker just before the disappearance. That was my breaking point. I couldn't pretend anymore. I dug into those reports, reading them obsessively. Online forums dedicated to the sightings spun wild theories Bigfoot, werewolves, even aliens. I didn't care what it was, I just needed to know I wasn't alone in seeing the impossible. I found them eventually. A small, tightly knit group who called themselves the Trackers. Folks who neither had encounters like mine or lost loved ones to the disappearances. They weren't ghost hunters, not conspiracy nuts. Just ordinary people, hardened by shared trauma, desperate for answers. And unlike the rest of the world, they believed me. With them, I finally started to feel a twisted kind of purpose. The trackers operated in a gray area, researching old legends, mapping out hot spots of sightings, sharing information quietly between those they could trust. And sometimes, sometimes they went out there, armed and prepared, hoping for a confrontation that could explain the unexplainable. My first trip back into the woods with them was an ordeal. Every creak of a branch had me flinching, expecting those eyes to appear in the gloom. But there was strength in their company, a grim determination that overrode the fear. We found no sign of the creature that time, but found something else, a pattern. The sightings clustered in specific areas, often places with a history of strange disappearances stretching back decades. That changed everything. It wasn't random anymore. These creatures, whatever they were, they had territories, hunting grounds. It made them feel more real, in a horrifying way, but it also gave us something to work with. The aftermath of my experience isn't clean-cut. No final showdown, no heroic takedown of the monster. Instead, it's an ongoing battle fought in the shadows. The trackers were growing, slowly building a network across national parks where these things have been reported. We spread the word subtly, finding those who know the truth without inciting mass panic. Some days, I wake up and think it's all madness, that the world is exactly as it seems. Then I'll see a news article about an unexplained disappearance, or stumble across old native legends describing a creature that sounds eerily familiar, and the madness feels more like the only sane response. I don't go deep into the woods alone anymore. I haven't touched a fishing rod since that day. But I'm not broken, not the way I was before. The trackers, they gave me back a sense of control twisted as it is. Maybe we'll never figure out just what stalks the wild places. Maybe the best we can hope for is to warn others, to fight back enough so that fewer people vanish into the glare of those yellow eyes. But even that tiny purpose, it's enough to keep going, enough to offset the nightmares that still come. Because I know, somewhere out there in the dark corners of the wilderness, the hunt continues. This happened to me a few years back. Back then, solo road trips were my escape. Folks think that sounds lonely, but for this city planner with too much traffic and not enough quiet, the open road felt like freedom. My name is Harlan, by the way. My folks always insisted on unique monikers for their brood. My chosen destination this time was Utah, Red Canyons, a real contrast to the gray urban sprawl I endured back home. I'd stocked up my RV with all the usual gear sleeping bag, hiking boots, maps, plenty of granola bars. What I hadn't prepared for was what stumbled onto my path deep in Zion National Park. Don't get me wrong, I'd done the popular trails. 
You know the type. Ones filled with selfie-taking crowds and kids in matching shirts. Thing is, the more remote stretches held more allure. There was a marked path called Kalab Narrows I'd read about on some outdoor adventure blog. They boasted about stunning slot canyons, towering rock formations, the works. And according to reviews, it was guaranteed to be less crowded due to the challenge factor. That sounded more my speed. So, bright and early one morning, I packed a lightweight day pack and got myself to the trailhead. Now, nature isn't my whole identity like those survivalist types, but I have common sense a compass was on me, plenty of water, all packed with my usual attention to detail. There weren't too many folks starting out at my hour, a bonus indeed. The first couple of miles were gorgeous sandstone formations that felt otherworldly, streams with water so clear you could see fish darting about. The trail followed the river at times, making for a bit of rock hopping, but nothing overly intense. However, as the day wore on, I noticed a shift. The crowds had vanished, the path narrowed, and I'd swear the rock faces enclosed with every step. No cell signal, of course, something I should have anticipated. Yet there was this pull forwards, the thought of whatever waited out there. Maybe some jaw-dropping rock formation, something most tourists never witness. Stupid in hindsight, maybe, but it didn't feel that way in the moment. It must have been mid-afternoon when I reached a part of the trail that bordered a particularly treacherous stretch of river. This wasn't kiddie pool level. We're talking rapids, maybe ten yards across between canyon walls that stretched so high, they blocked out the sky itself. It felt like some ancient gate barring progress. And at that very moment, it dawned on me, I hadn't spotted another human the entire afternoon. I wasn't about to take some ridiculous risk and ford that water alone. It would mean turning back. Admitting a bit of defeat, maybe, but that's the sensible course of action, right? Still, it rankled. Something in me stubbornly yearned to continue, but even as I contemplated my choices, an eerie silence descended. No bird calls, not even a cricket's chirp, it sent shivers down my spine. Then, as I pivoted back, I froze. Maybe twenty feet away. Obscured in the shadow of a massive boulder, stood a figure, a man-shaped figure, at least. All I could register was an impression of size, large, larger than any one I'd ever met, and his form seemed distorted by the rock's jagged outline. My instincts screamed for a clear look to assess my situation. Yet, as my eyes refocused, I stumbled back with a shocked shout. This person held something slick and crimson in his hand, something not animal. In my gut I knew that was blood. My shout didn't startle him. There was this casual turn of the head, like a hawk regarding some tiny critter scuttling past. Our eyes met, or did they? I couldn't quite tell from behind his ragged hair and tangled beard. There was just emptiness in that look, then, as easily as he appeared, he slipped back behind his shadowed perch, vanishing from sight. Logic? Rationality? All that disappeared. Suddenly, that treacherous river seemed far less terrifying than the shadowy form who stalked it. Fear turned my muscles to ice, then pushed me into motion. Every rock scramble back through the narrowing canyon felt like an escape out of the clutches of death itself. There was no sense of distance or time, just blind need to flee. I reached the RV near exhaustion, stumbling over my own words at the park ranger station as I gasped out something garbled about an attack, some madman in the woods. Later, there was the search party. There were cops asking endless questions and that knowing uncertainty about whether they believed me. Maybe they thought I'd hallucinated from heat exhaustion which wouldn't be an unreasonable conclusion based on how I appeared. 
Of course, they found nothing, no tracks, no sign of that shadowy predator. The cops seemed resigned. The rangers offered those patronizing reassurances about getting lost and the park's size. And the worst part? The suspicion I started to have about, well, whatever those crimson, sticky pieces had been I saw clutched in the hand of that haunting figure. There went my hiking. It wasn't some dramatic conversion to city life I had, more like a gradual shift. You get out on some trail now, see people start vanishing around the bend, and that deep primal fear takes root. Then I imagine those eyes, vacant and predatory, peeking out from behind some overgrown scrub, and even if common sense says that's improbable, fear doesn't work with logic. So, now my open roads lead towards more populated destinations, and my maps stay close to the interstates, where signs of civilization abound. Less adventurous than what I craved before, maybe, but I swear, sometimes you hear stories on the news about disappearances in isolated regions. Missing hikers whose cases just sort of trail off without answers, and all I can see, when I hear them, is that figure lurking in the shadows. Maybe my brush with darkness in that Utah Canyon is the closest I'll ever come to knowing what true evil looks like. Frankly, it's an experience I could have lived a full, happy life without. My name is Jason Cole and this happened to me in September of 2012. I spent 10 years as a field operative with the CIA's Special Activities Center, the ones who get sent in for the stuff that can't be on the books. Now I'm a glorified file clerk, a ghost in a gray suit. Some days I almost wish I'd never set foot in those Nevada mountains. They tasked me and a small team to investigate a series of disappearances near an abandoned military base in the Nevada desert. Hikers, prospectors, the odd conspiracy theorists poking around too close to Area 5-1, all vanished, without a trace. Locals had stories, whispered tales about strange lights, eerie noises from the desolate hills where the old base was located. Mostly, I chalked it up to human error, the desert being an unforgiving place to get lost. My team was a mixed bag. There was Pierce, seasoned ex-military, the voice of reason. Michaels, a tech specialist, young and full of quips. And then there was Dr. Evelyn Reed, a biologist attached to the project thanks to some high-level corporate interest in her research. I wasn't privy to the details just knew she was essential and not to be questioned. We set up a base camp near the perimeter of the old facility. Razor wire fences, crumbling concrete bunkers, the usual relics of Cold War paranoia. The desert stretched away in every direction, shimmering and empty under the relentless sun. First few days were routine surveying the area, tracking old paths, trying to find some pattern in the disappearances. It got weird on the fourth night. Michaels picked up some sort of signal on his scanner, a low-frequency pulse emanating from somewhere deep under the base. Pierce brushed it off as probably old equipment malfunctioning. I was more intrigued. That kind of signal, it shouldn't have been there. Dr. Reed was the one who insisted we investigate. Turns out, her precious research involved bioluminescence and unusual electromagnetic frequencies. She was convinced whatever was down there was connected to her work somehow. Pierce rolled his eyes, but I had a hunch the lady scientist had more sway than her mild demeanor let on. Next morning, we geared up and headed into the underground complex. The entrance was a hidden tunnel, blasted into the rock under a derelict barracks. It was dark, damp, the air thick with dust, and the faint smell of something chemical. Our flashlights cut through the gloom, 
casting long, distorted shadows on the pitted concrete walls. The pulse grew stronger as we descended, a rhythmic thrumming that set my teeth on edge. About a hundred yards down, we hit the first signs of something. The tunnel floor was slick with a pulpy, iridescent substance. At first, I figured it was just phosphorescent fungus, the kind you sometimes find in caves. But then Michael shone his UV light at it, and we all recoiled in disgust. It wasn't fungus. It was a trail of slime, glistening and viscous. And embedded in it were remains. Not human, thank God. Bones, half dissolved, insectal in form, mixed with something that looked disturbingly like melted plastic. Whatever did that had a hell of a digestive system. Dr. Reed was practically vibrating with excitement, which sent up all kinds of alarm bells in my head. I told Pierce we were turning back, that whatever was down here wasn't worth risking our necks over. But then the pulse changed. It shifted went from a steady throb to a staccato beat. Then came a noise that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. It started as a low chittering, like a nest of insects amplified a thousand times. Then it rose, a wail that echoed through the tunnels, chilling us to the bone. Pierce didn't need more convincing. Let's get the hell out of here, he shouted. We turned and ran. The creature, because there was definitely a creature down there, made no move to immediately pursue us. But the chittering, the wailing, it followed us all the way up to the surface. We burst out of the tunnel and radioed for extraction, our reports frantic and disjointed. Dr. Reed, however, insisted we wait. Even with that unholy wailing echoing around us, she started setting up recording equipment, mumbling about unique frequencies and communication patterns. By this point, I was ready to drag her out of there forcibly. And that's when the ground erupted beside us. A segmented claw, as thick as a tree trunk, burst through the dirt, showering us with debris. Then another, and another. The creature was massive, its carapace a grotesque fusion of beetle-like chitin and pulsing, bioluminescent flesh. I can't describe the head, not properly. A mass of glowing eyes and writhing tendrils dominated by a gaping maw lined with serrated teeth. It roared, if you can call that insected shriek a roar, and lunged. Michaels was the first to go. The claw scooped him up like he was nothing more than a bug, and he vanished into that cavernous maw with a final truncated scream. I was firing wildly. Standard issue 9 millimeters against that monstrosity was laughable, but there wasn't much else to do. Dr. Reed was on her knees, staring, not screaming, just making a small, mewling noise that was horrifying in its own way. Pierce, God bless his hard-headed soul, was the practical one. Smoke! He barked lobbing a smoke grenade right at the creature's face. It screeched, momentarily disoriented by the thick cloud. Run! Pierce hauled Dr. Reed to her feet, and we sprinted for the base camp. I risked a glance back. The creature was thrashing, claws ripping at the air, momentarily blinded. It wouldn't last long. We collapsed behind a jeep, gasping for breath. Pierce swore, a string of expletives that did nothing to ease the pounding terror in my chest. I expected the creature to come barreling after us any second, its roars shaking the ground. But all we heard was a fading chittering, a rustling that seemed to retreat back underground. It was, letting us go? Then the radio crackled. It was base command, voice tight with urgency. Our extraction chopper was inbound, but there was a weather anomaly approaching fast. Translation. Some high-level brass had spotted whatever the hell we'd stirred up, and we were about to be sanitized off the map. We had a choice, 
chopper and probable disappearance into some black site, or our chances in the desert with that thing lurking beneath our feet. Pierce didn't hesitate. We run, he rasped, then looked pointedly at Dr. Reed. Listen, Doc, whatever your bosses are into, it ain't worth dying over. Ditch the research, ditch the gear, let's move. She blinked, as if coming out of a daze, then gave a shaky nod. We destroyed her equipment, grabbed minimal survival kits, and fled into the desolate landscape. We ran for hours. The weather anomaly closed in fast, not a natural storm, but a thick, choking fog that rolled over the desert and blotted out the sun. We lost our bearings, stumbled our way through the haze, the ground underfoot feeling oddly unstable. Every now and then, a muffled chittering would echo from somewhere in the fog, and we'd freeze, hearts pounding. By nightfall, we were done. Collapsed in a shallow arroyo, we huddled together for warmth, listening to the unnatural rustling in the fog. Whispers of claws on stone, too close for comfort. Dr. Reed broke first. Sobbing, she spilled out the truth, or what she thought was the truth. Her research, funded by some shady corporation, involved manipulating electromagnetic frequencies to lure and, in theory, control bioluminescent organisms. That damn pulse, it wasn't natural. They'd built a damn monster magnet. Pierce raged and I... I was too numb for anger. We'd been played, pawns to trigger some experiment gone catastrophically wrong. The aftermath is a blur. There were no heroics, no last stand. Just the three of us, trapped in the fog, waiting for the inevitable. We died out there, one by one. I don't even know how it got us in the end. Claws, teeth, the corrosive slime we'd seen, it doesn't matter. Just that we vanished, like all the others. They scrubbed the incident, of course. Probably some BS story about a flash flood wiping out our team. But sometimes, at night, when the city seems too quiet, I hear the clicking of insect legs under the floorboards, smell the sharp chemical tang of that tunnel, see the creature's multifaceted eyes glowing in the darkness. Maybe they covered up what happened in that desert. But what they created, that's still out there. Breeding, growing, waiting for the next signal that draws it back to the surface. Maybe it's even learned by now. Learn that the pulse that lures it also means prey. My name is, or rather was, Jason Cole. Maybe I'm just some forgotten file in a basement. But the world up there has a blind spot, a patch of desert where the shadows hide a monstrous secret. And every time some poor fool stumbles across those signals, broadcasts their presence out into the uncaring dark, the creature stirs a little further from its slumber. It remembers us, remembers the taste of our fear. My name is Alex Thorne, and this happened to me on July 22, 1997. A day etched into my memory like a fresh scar. I was working undercover at the time. Not your typical CIA desk job, no, sir. My team operated in the shadows, handling threats that never made the evening news. The kind of work that earned you enemies, but never a commendation medal. Three years back, I had a wife. Sarah. She was the light that drew me back from the darkness of my job. Then came that damn phone call, a car accident, and with it, my world went dark. I buried myself deeper into my work. It was the only way I knew how to cope. This particular assignment was, well, bizarre even by my standards. Something unsettling was brewing deep in the Ozarks. Reports of disappearances, locals whispering about strange lights in the forest, cattle mutilations. 
The official explanation was a drug cartel using the backwoods for nefarious activities. But after years on the job, you develop a sixth sense for when something just doesn't add up. My partner, Donovan, was a no-nonsense ex-marine. Built like a tank, with a voice that could rattle windows. Don't overthink it, Thorn. He'd growl whenever I'd voice my suspicions. Cartel thugs, pure and simple. The target was a remote farmhouse nestled amidst rolling hills cloaked in dense forest. Our intel was sketchy, suspected drug lab, heavily armed, orders to infiltrate and secure evidence. Standard stuff, at least on the surface. Daylight was fading as we approached the farmhouse. An unnatural stillness choked the air. Donovan held up a fist, signaling a halt. Hold up, something's not right. Too quiet. I knew exactly what he meant. There was no hum of a generator, no flicker of lights, none of the usual signs of a remote operation. The hair prickled on the back of my neck. You finally getting those spook vibes, too? I joked, trying to mask my growing unease. Donovan grunted, his eyes narrowed. This place has got a bad smell to it, Thorn. We moved as one, weapons drawn, boots crunching on gravel. Each step seemed to amplify the oppressive silence. I reached the weathered wooden porch, Donovan covering my back. The front door hung slightly ajar. You take point, Donovan said, already shouldering his rifle. I eased the door inward, peering into the gloom. The living room was a scene of frozen chaos, an overturned table, scattered papers, chairs lying on their sides as if knocked over in a hurry. Frowning, I took a cautious step inside. From the corner of my eye, I caught a flicker of movement in the hallway. I whipped around, rifle raised, but there was nothing there. Donovan, I saw it too, he muttered, his voice tense. Something ain't right here. We advanced, sweeping each room. Kitchen, bedrooms. All empty, all showing signs of a hasty departure. Reaching the back of the house, I noticed a door leading down into a cellar. Even from where I stood, a faint, rotten stench drifted up, causing a wave of nausea to wash over me. Donovan nudged me with an elbow. Well, we ain't gonna find any meth cookers down there. I flicked on my flashlight, the beams slicing into the inky depths. I'll go first, keep me covered. I said, the words coming out tighter than I intended. He didn't argue, merely nodded grimly. Taking a steadying breath, I began to descend the rickety wooden stairs. With each creak, my unease deepened. The beam of my flashlight illuminated a small, earthen-floored room. My stomach churned at the sight that awaited me. It was a scene ripped straight from a nightmare. Animal carcasses, deer, raccoons, maybe even a dog— lay in twisted piles, the floor awash in gore. But it was the way the bodies were mutilated, the unnatural angles and gaping wounds, that sent a jolt of pure horror through me. Sweet Jesus! Donovan muttered from above. I wanted to run, just turn and flee from this place of madness. But duty, or perhaps some flicker of morbid curiosity, kept me rooted to the spot. Slowly, I panned my light around the room. It snagged on something propped in the far corner, half hidden by shadows. A newspaper clipping pinned to the damp earth wall. The headline made my blood run cold. Locals baffled sixth unexplained disappearance in two months. My breath hitched as I scanned the accompanying article. It detailed the vanishing of the farmhouse residents a family of four. No trace, no clues, only whispers of strange occurrences in the weeks leading up to their disappearance. As I read, an icy dread settled over me. We weren't dealing with drug dealers. We were dealing with something else entirely. 
my flashlight beam darted back to the carcasses. These weren't the work of any wild animal. They were trophies left behind by something both monstrous and methodical. A low growl echoed from the darkness, snapping my head around. Donovan shouted a warning from the top of the stairs, his voice laced with panic. Before I could register his words, the cellar erupted. A hulking form lunged from the shadows, a whirlwind of claws and teeth. I stumbled back, firing blindly as the creature barreled into me. The stench of it was overpowering, a mix of decay and something sulfurous that burned my lungs. Donovan's rifle roared from above, bullets tearing into the monstrosity. It roared, less like an animal and more like some twisted parody of a human scream. The force of the impact knocked me to the cellar floor, my rifle skittering away. Dazed, the world spinning, I saw a massive clawed hand swipe towards me. A searing pain ripped through my forearm. I scrambled away, scrambling for purchase on the slick, blood-soaked floor. The creature loomed over me, its silhouette a jagged distortion in the dim light filtering from above. For the first time, I got a clear look at it. It was massive, easily seven feet tall when hunched. Thick, leathery skin stretched over bulging muscles. The head was elongated, the muzzle filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth. But it was the eyes that sent shivers down my spine, glowing crimson orbs filled with a ravenous hunger. Another swipe of its claws sent me tumbling. The world tilted crazily, the creature's roar echoing in my skull. It pounced, pinning me to the floor with a weight that threatened to crush me. Hot, rancid breath washed over my face. I thrashed uselessly, but the creature held me fast. I was trapped, my final moments spent staring into the depths of those inhuman eyes. Suddenly, a flicker of movement above, Donovan, vaulting over the cellar railing, his rifle shattering the silence. The creature twisted its head, momentarily distracted. With a desperate surge of strength, I shoved against its chest, buying enough space to roll sideways. Donovan hit the floor beside me. His rifle barked again, the concussive blast deafening in the enclosed space. I staggered upright, my vision swimming. The creature was wounded, crimson streaming from its flank. But it was far from dead. It circled us low growls rumbling deep in its throat. Donovan ejected a spent clip and slammed in a fresh one. Thorn, get the hell out of here! He shouted. I didn't need telling twice. I scrambled for the stairs, my pulse hammering in my ears. Reaching the top, I risked a glance back. Donovan had emptied his magazine into the creature. It staggered, but still it came on. He fumbled for another clip, his face a mask of grim determination. There wasn't time. The creature lunged, a blur of claws and teeth. Donovan shouted a curse, throwing up his rifle in a futile attempt to block the attack. And then it was on him, a sickening symphony of tearing flesh and splintering bone echoing up the stairwell. My legs acted before my brain could process what I'd just witnessed. I slammed the cellar door shut and fumbled with the bolt. From below came a final, blood-curdling scream followed by a wet, tearing sound. Stumbling backwards, I crashed into the kitchen table, sending it toppling. The world spun around me, my stomach lurching. Donovan was gone. Sacrificed, buying me a few precious seconds. I didn't wait around to see what would emerge from the cellar. I tore through the kitchen, out the back door, and into the dense, suffocating forest. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs buckled beneath me. Branches whipped my face, thorns tore at my skin, but I didn't stop, the creatures and human growls echoing in my mind. I had no idea where I was going, 
only that I had to put as much distance between me and that accursed farmhouse as I could. Eventually, I stumbled onto a gravel road. In the growing pre-dawn light, I saw a truck approaching. Flagging it down with frantic desperation, I collapsed into the passenger seat, gasping out incoherent half-truths about a hunting accident and a friend in need of help. The driver, a grizzled old farmer, took one look at my wild eyes and blood-soaked clothes and didn't question a word. He drove me to the nearest town, where I made an anonymous call to the agency, my voice shaking. What I reported was standard protocol, an operation gone wrong, a firefight, my partner dead. What I didn't report was the creature. What I didn't report was the gnawing fear that it might still be out there, waiting, hunting. They called me a hero, pinned more medals on my chest, and buried Donovan with full honors. I played my part, the grieving survivor, all the while feeling like a coward who'd abandoned his post. In the empty silence of my apartment, the creature haunted my nightmares, its crimson eyes burning in the darkness. I left the agency soon after. Couldn't face the lies, couldn't face the desks and the suits pretending monsters didn't exist in the shadowy corners of the world. Some cases don't end with closure, they leave scars on your soul. I drifted around for a while, taking odd jobs, trying to outrun my demons, but they always seemed to be one step behind. The truth is, you can't hide from something that might not even be human, something that exists outside the realm of logic and reason. Years have passed, but the memory of that day in the Ozarks hasn't faded. I see the creature's eyes every time I close mine. I hear its guttural growls echoing in my ears. I carry Donovan's death like a stone in my gut. People ask what happened to change me, to harden me. The answer is something they would never believe. Some truths are too terrible, too fantastical, to survive the light of day. Those truths they keep locked up in windowless rooms with men in starched suits. I live on the edge of society now, a drifter, a ghost. The world sees me as broken, damaged. Maybe they're right. But then again, maybe I'm the only sane one left, the only one who sees the shadows lurking just out of sight. It was probably five years back when it happened. I was fresh out of ranger school, full of big ideas about saving the environment, protecting the wildlife, all that good stuff. Seemed like the Everglades was the perfect place to start, if you can stomach the humidity and the bugs. My name's Kellen, Kellen Parks. I was assigned to Fakahatchee Strand, way down south, the heart of the Ten Thousand Islands. It's wild down there, thick cypress forests, tangled mangrove roots twisting up out of the water, sawgrass prairies stretching as far as the eye can see. Not as many people venture out that far, but that was just fine by me. Like the quiet, like being alone with the land and the critters. There used to be an old hunting camp out in the middle of the preserve, a little clearing up on a hammock with a rusted-out Airstream trailer and a shed. Rangers had stopped patrolling that route regularly a few years back, said it wasn't worth the manpower. Figured folks smart enough to trek that far into the wilderness wouldn't be causing much trouble anyway. Turns out, sometimes folks do crazy things. A group of hikers had been reported missing, last seen heading off the boardwalk trail towards that old camp. My supervisor asked if I could take a jeep out, do a sweep of the area, put up some signs at least. Seemed simple enough. I rolled up to the clearing in the late afternoon. Sun beat down through the branches, and the air shimmered with heat. Place was quiet. You ever get that feeling, like you're being watched? even if you don't see anyone around? 
Well, I had it strong. I found what was left of the hikers a few yards back into the trees. They hadn't been natural deaths, if you get my meaning. Tore up in a way no gator or panther would do. I radioed it in, sick to my stomach. Told my supervisor I didn't feel safe waiting for backup alone out there. He said help was on the way, but they wouldn't make it till morning. I didn't head back to the jeep, though. Didn't know why. Reckon there's something inside us that wants to know, even when the smarter part of your brain screams to run. Maybe that's what makes someone a ranger, or maybe it makes us dumb as rocks. I followed a trail of broken branches and disturbed undergrowth deeper into the trees. Came across the shed just as the sun was setting, painting the swamp in streaks of orange and blood red. Sounded like something was moving in the shadows underneath it. Figured it was a deer or a raccoon, so I called out to scare it off. Didn't want whatever it was coming at me in the dark. But nothing ran out. Something shifted beneath the shed, though, something big. I drew my gun, took a slow step closer, the smell of rot and decay nearly gagging me. And that's when I saw it. Thing was tall, even hunched over like it was. Pale white skin stretched tight over bone, like it was half-starved. Eyes were big and sunk deep in its skull, staring right out at me. Empty like it didn't recognize me as a person. Its mouth opened, a low hissing sound escaping its throat. That's when I saw the teeth, too many, sharp and jagged, stained red with blood that wasn't its own. My hand tightened on the gun, but my finger froze on the trigger. Some part of me knew shooting was pointless. This wasn't an animal, not one I'd ever seen in a textbook. It took a rattling step closer, its head tipped at an odd angle, its neck bent in a way that shouldn't be possible. That's when I turned and ran. Didn't bother looking back, just tore through the cypress knees and tangled roots, the rasp and hiss of the thing chasing at my heels. Branches whipped at my face, mud sucked on my boots. Stumbled and fell into a patch of sawgrass, the sharp blades cutting my hands didn't stop. Scrambled to my feet and kept running. Knew if I stopped, it would be over. That thing would sink its teeth into my flesh, rip me apart like it had those hikers. I burst out of the trees right as the twilight slipped away into full darkness. There were voices, headlamps flashing across the clearing. The relief that hit me nearly made my legs buckle. Backup had arrived. A swarm of rangers poured into the trees, armed and shouting. I pointed them in the direction of that shed, collapsed onto the rough ground, gasping for breath. They scoured the area, searched for hours. Found no sign of whatever that creature was. I gave a statement, but the look the head ranger gave me said it all. Probably thought I'd gone nuts from the heat and the shock of finding the bodies. Maybe they even wrote the whole thing off as bear attack. I was cleared to go back to work a week later. Never went back to the Fakahatchee Strand, though. I'll patrol the tourist-filled boardwalks now, thank you very much. You'd think after seeing something like that, you'd stop believing in anything weird. But that's not how it works. I hear the stories the old-timers tell, legends of the swamp. Things that lurk in the shadows where the light can't reach. Now, I look out at the sawgrass prairies, at the dark tangles of the mangroves and cypress swamps, and I wonder. They call it the skunk ape, the booger, the swamp monster. Maybe the thing that stalked me in the fading twilight had a name once, in a world older than ours. I don't know. All I know is I saw something real out there. And sometimes, when the moon is just a sliver, and the swamp fog rolls in thick, I think I can still hear its hissing breaths echoing in the stillness.
The sun was beginning to set as I dragged my tired body to the doorstep of the cabin in the heart of Vermont's Green Mountain National Forest. My name is Arnold Baskin, and I made this last-minute escape to the woods in an attempt to get away from the painful memories of my recent divorce. The cabin was a modest structure, with aged wooden planks and a small porch surrounding it. I could smell the earthy scent of the forest surrounding me as I settled in. The solemn environment felt like a drastic change from my mundane life and brought me a sense of tranquility. My new temporary neighbors were an odd couple, Judy Womack, a middle-aged woman with gossip tendencies I could sense immediately, and Phil Ezra, an amiable handyman living locally. The duo would often visit me for evening chit-chats that I surprisingly didn't mind much. One particularly isolating day, I found myself compelled to explore deeper into the forest. Taking note of ominous yellow caution tape running across trees, in retrospect, foreshadowing trouble, I grew more curious, wondering about what secrets this place held. With each step inside the dense greenery, the atmosphere felt oddly tense. Unknown to me at that time, my path led inexorably toward horror. Stumbling upon an abandoned campsite from years long gone, I noticed traces of abnormal carnage, partially destroyed camping equipment, and pitch-black scorch marks on tree trunks alike hinted at a gruesome finale for those unwitting visitors. Unsettled yet curious, I vowed to find more information about what had taken place there. Discussing it with Judy later on as Phil worked on his truck outside, she mentioned hushed whispers in town about something menacing lurking in these woods a creature far from human that locals referred to only as it. I brushed it off as rural talk. Surely this was merely a half-formed tale meant only to frighten. Life proceeded as expected for a few days until one night. I was distracted by a strange rustling noise close to the cabin. Moments later, horrific screams ripped through the air as I saw Phil struggling in a hopeless fight with a grotesque monstrous being. The creature had indescribable features, a mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth, an amalgamation of scales and hide covering its twisted body, and disproportionate limbs that granted it unhealthy speed and strength. Terrified, I darted back into the cabin and bolted the flimsy door before calling the police frantically. Minutes that felt like Ian's passed as Phil's dying screams reached a crescendo only to be silenced abruptly. It was then replaced by an uncanny stillness, momentarily raising hope that it had departed. The local authorities arrived to find both Phil's remains and me in complete shock. After recounting my experience to them in disbelieving fragments— they dismissed my eyewitness account of the antagonist by claiming my distraught state had caused misidentification of a large predator. Frustrated by their lack of concern or understanding, Judy and I couldn't do anything more than grieve. With every passing day, we struggled between processing Phil's untimely death and what it truly meant to face this otherworldly antagonist we dared not confront. We tried reaching out for help from neighbors deep in the woods, but no one responded. Perhaps they too had become victims or fled in terror. An overwhelming sense of dread settled over our once serene cabin enclave as we clung to hope, false hope, that this nightmare would soon end. Time weighed heavy on our shoulders as loneliness combined with ticking clock anxiety wound us into tightly wound coils that could no longer remain stationary. Our conversations delved deeper into local history searching for answers, from stories of missing persons unresolved over decades to whispers about hikers who ventured into the woods never to return. We finally stumbled upon the diaries of previous victims' family members a gruesome discovery with fragments of text that rubbed salt in our festering wounds. As I flipped through doggered pages, a chill ran down my spine. The more we uncovered about our unknown adversary, the closer we felt to it. 
The scratches and jarring sounds outside the cabin seemed to grow more ominous at nightfall, mocking us as we clung to any sense of sanctity. One day, while searching the cabin for supplies, I found an old radio tucked away in a dusty corner. We decided to use it to call for help, but we were only greeted by static and silence. Frustrated, I slammed my fist against the table, knocking over the radio in the process. Suddenly, a deep voice emerged through the crackle of static. Hello? Is anyone there? We exchanged glances before Judy responded cautiously. Yes. We're here. Can you help us? There's something out here with us. The voice replied. Please remain calm. I'm part of a team responsible for dealing with situations like this. Tell me everything that's happened. As Judy recounted our nightmarish encounters with the creature and our suspicions about it being linked to local disappearances, the voice on the radio confirmed our fears. Yes, what you're describing matches the behavior patterns of what we believe is a large carnivorous predator, he explained. Over time... This creature has learned to blend into its surroundings and take advantage of people living in isolated cabins. After providing us with detailed guidance on how to defend ourselves and how to track any potential signs of the creature's presence, he suggested we try to find any evidence they could use in their case against it. However, we knew that taking matters into our own hands was not an option. We were just its prey targets. Our main focus now was merely surviving until help arrived. As days passed, we made progress birdproofing and reinforcing our cabin by boarding up the windows and securing all possible entrances, making our home a fortress that would hopefully keep out the beast. One evening, as we huddled side by side in front of a dying fire, Exhausted from our efforts of making it through another day seemingly unnoticed by the antagonists prowling outside, we heard something large slam against one of the boarded windows. At that instant, a strip of wood splintered with a loud crack, giving way to a gaping hole in our makeshift protective barrier. From what we could see through that hole in the fading light of dusk invading our cabin's interior, we gaped in terror at the sight before us. The creature was enormous, with matted fur covering its muscular body, and it stood on two legs like a human, though its elongated face displayed rows of jagged teeth within its snarling mouth. We had unwittingly invited its wrath by reinforcing our cabin, and it became determined to break through the barricade we had placed between us. It let out a guttural roar that echoed through the forest as it started tearing at the walls of our home with an insatiable hunger to reach its prey inside. At once, Judy and I grabbed whatever belongings we had nearby, our coats and few supplies, and hurriedly escaped through the back entrance into the cold night beyond. We stumbled through the forest on pure adrenaline. Behind us, we could hear those splintering cracks continuing as if an entire tree was being crushed under some colossus heel, followed by brief silence until we knew it realized we were gone. Running desperately for our lives with no direction or destination except away from the encroaching terror, we were suddenly startled by distant voices. Among them rang out the familiar tone from someone who had been on that radio days ago. Over here! We've found them. Though exhausted beyond measure and passing out from accumulated anxiety and fatigue took over, we finally felt some semblance of security. The help had finally arrived. These people looking out for others like us were themselves victims of this thing. With their aid, Judy and I left that accursed cabin deep within the woods where a predator, dangerously intelligent and fiendishly ferocious, stood as evidence. Some nightmares walk among us mere humans. And though the creature's identity remained uncertain, it would serve as a horrifying reminder of the potential evil lurking in the dark corners of an isolated world, forever tormenting those left behind by life's twists and turns.
It was just another ordinary shift for me. My name is Llewellyn Nathanson, a veteran truck driver of over 15 years. I had a container to deliver up at the old logging factory in the hills of Vermont, a place that used to be bustling with activity, but now it was a giant graveyard of rusted machinery and abandoned buildings. The road started getting rougher as I made my way deeper into the dense forest. As I shifted gears, a burst of static came through my CB radio. I adjusted the knob to find a clear channel but caught an odd snippet of conversation from what sounded like another trucker sharing an experience about someone following him in these woods. The interference became unbearable, so I went back to my own business. I finally reached the destination, feeling relieved that this would be my final stop on this long driving day. But as soon as I stepped out of the cab and approached the decrepit wooden building, a palpable tension seemed to hang in the air. Instead of the typical silence that surrounded these isolated areas, faint echoes of movement and muffled whispers seemed to play on every direction. Afraid that I've stumbled upon some illegal business going on in this abandoned place, I decided to keep my head down and get back on the road as fast as possible. As I now focused on securing the container lock to begin unloading my delivery, I felt an icy coldness creep up at back. Hearing glass shatter in one of the old factory buildings nearby forced me to look closer. Through shattered windows illuminated by shards of moonlight darting through broken panes was a male figure tall, lean, and bald with piercing eyes monitoring my every move from behind dismantled machinery. In one hand he clutched what looked like a carved wooden stake sharpened at both ends. Hey there! What's your business here? I called out nervously, trying to sound more brave than I felt. But he just stood there, unmoving, his gaze dissecting my soul from a distance. A few heartbeats later, another noise from my left caught my attention a thud and as soon as I looked back at the window, the mysterious figure was gone. Panic started worming its way through me, and instincts told me to cut my work short. I attempted dial friends on my cell phone but discovered zero signal in this area. The eerie thought of him trailing behind me resurfaced from that overheard conversation earlier. Unable to contact anyone for help and feeling absolutely unwelcome, I abandoned the delivery and rushed back into the cab. I turned the ignition and sped down the bumpy path, frantically scanning for any signs of the enigmatic figure in pursuit. Truck's headlights flickered across drooping branches that closed in on either side of the trail like bony arms reaching out to trap me. A sudden bang and metallic screech came from beneath my truck a puncture was all I needed right now. Despite the vehement tremors, I hammered through wanting to put as much distance as possible between this nightmarish place and myself. My breathing now ragged, an odd snigger inaudible at first grew louder in my ears, a disturbing guttural laugh that seemed to seep through every crack of my cabin until it drowned every other sound. My heart now threatened to burst free from its cage as sweat beads gathered on my forehead. Could it be? Was he in here with me? The metallic shrieking intensified like claws scraping against asphalt when suddenly all hell broke loose. An ear-shattering roar shook the cabin, followed by what felt like an almighty whack to the side of the vehicle making it roll violently. Thousands of thoughts raced through my brain, an abrupt tree trunk uprooted by an avalanche perhaps? But no, it couldn't be. Not on this treacherous muddy road packed with rotting leaves. As the truck continued to lurch, tossing me side to side, a sense of hopelessness set in. An overpowering force seemed to tighten its grip around my chest, suffocating me as if underwater. Grasping for anything in sight, I fought to regain stability when my eyes caught a glimpse of something appalling through the windscreen. Through the windscreen, I saw a monstrous figure. Covered head to toe in bloodied clothing, his twisted and distorted features hidden behind a makeshift mask of deep terror. 
His eyes burned like fiery embers as he slammed into the side of my truck. I clutched my phone, debating on using it to call for help. But I hesitated, unsure if anyone could even reach me in time. What hope did I have against this maniacal foe? Everything felt surreal, as though it couldn't possibly be happening. However, the pangs of intense panic reiterated that this was reality. The man continued his carnage outside, ripping at my truck with seemingly inhuman strength. Time crawled to almost a standstill as I frantically tried to come up with an escape plan. As if sensing my thoughts, the man suddenly stopped and stared at me through the windshield. It was as though he was daring me to make a move, challenging me. Driven purely by survival instincts, I leaped out from the other side of the vehicle and ran as fast as I could. My legs carried me through the woods despite their trembling from exhaustion and fear. Unyielding trees obscured my path as branches clawed at me like outstretched hands. The haunting laughter echoed through the darkness and increased its volume, making it sound like it was all around me. As I pushed onward, a stroke of luck seemed to emerge, lights flickering in the distance. Fueled by hope at last, I focused on reaching that beacon while desperately choking back a scream. Moments felt like hours until I finally reached salvation a seemingly abandoned cabin in the woods with an old phone installed on the wall. Relief washed over me as I quickly dialed 911, explaining my situation with frenzied urgency. The response came surprisingly quick. Sirens pierced through the quiet night air like sharp-bladed weapons shredding through tension. The laughter ceased, adding a chilling note of uncertainty in the atmosphere. Police officers arrived on the scene, their guns at the ready, scouring the area for an indication of the nefarious phantom I had encountered. As they moved from tree to tree, searching meticulously, my breathing gradually normalized and relief washed over me. Eventually, one officer announced that there was no trace of any attacker but affirmed my ordeal by evidence strongly suggesting someone had been stalking me. I felt an involuntary shiver run down my spine. The next few days were marked by continuous police surveillance on the cabin as well as support from friends and loved ones digitally connecting with me. Meanwhile, news outlets picked up on my ordeal with voracious appetite. Conversations revolved around potential motives or reasons for this seemingly random act of terror but offered no real answers. Despite the safety measures taken to protect me and even with time passing in a blur of false security, I felt an undercurrent of fear and anxiety. However gruesome his attack was, it couldn't dampen my guilt for not trying harder to put an end to his reign of terror. Before leaving town, the police couldn't identify anyone who could have possibly posed such a malevolent figure. With no trace left behind nor any meaningful leads to follow up on, he remained an unidentified threat whose existence had managed to fade into fearful obscurity. As I moved forward with my life, unsettled by the lack of closure, I knew I could only express hope that no other innocent soul would ever encounter this nightmarish figure. For every day that passes henceforth, I reflect upon those we've lost— unnamed victims whose paths crossed tragically with a person cloaked in darkness who left behind nothing but carnage. Though never captured or identified outrightly by law enforcement, one thing remains painfully clear. Natural evil is not confined within imaginary monsters nor tales we tell ourselves at night but instead resides within and around us, lurking under a human guise. I remember the day it all started just another seemingly ordinary day on my route as a truck driver. My name's Damien Fortescue, and life's been nothing short of monotonous until that fateful moment. I was driving through a remote area in Nevada, making my way to a small town to deliver a shipment. The sun blazed overhead, its rays glinted off my truck's hood, 
causing me to squint. For some riveting entertainment, I began counting cacti that flanked the seemingly never-ending road. Look, Damien, there goes number fifty-two. I mumbled sarcastically to myself. As I continued driving, I caught a glimpse of a man in the distance, standing on the side of the deserted road. As I drew closer, I could see that he was an older man with gray hair and a scruffy beard. His clothes were ragged and dirty, sunbeaten much like the vast landscape through which we found ourselves. Yet there was something about him that made me uneasy his stance, his demeanor perhaps. My skepticism grew stronger with each passing second. However, my conscience got the better of me, so against my better judgment, I pulled over beside him. Hey there, I called out from my window. Are you okay? The man only stared back. Unnerved by his silence, but trying to maintain an air of nonchalance, I cracked a tame joke. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? No response. Before I could speak again or call for help which seemed pointless amidst the desolation, he suddenly lunged at me with an eerie grin on his face. The unexpected charge jarred me into action. I revved up my engine and continued down the road at breakneck speed. But it was only the beginning. The next few weeks brought with them unspeakable incidents, word of which began to leak out from the remote corners of the state. People were found mutilated, their bodies bearing marks of a disturbed mind and cruel hands, a map of pain and torture etched on their very flesh. Every bit of news sent shivers down my spine. The authorities were at a loss. There seemed to be no discernible pattern nor justification for these gruesome occurrences. Panic spread like wildfire, turning peaceful hamlets into bastions of fear and paranoia. Despite the ever-rising horror surrounding me, one image haunted my thoughts, that man on the desolate roadside and his hair-raising grin. But who could connect him to these freakish crimes? My gut told me there was a link. However, I couldn't voice it without sounding irrational or inviting unwanted attention. As days wore on, each delivery I made became an ordeal but I needed this job. Every time I stopped at unfamiliar locales, my senses heightened, searching for any sign of danger. Though utterly exhausted by the constant vigilance, I kept going to make ends meet. One fateful morning, I found myself once again driving down a secluded road, this time in southern Arizona. The radio was blaring some upbeat tune in stark contrast to my pensive mood. Suddenly, the signal faded out leaving only static behind. An overwhelming and inexplicable sense of dread washed over me just as tires screeched in the distance. No sooner had I swiveled my head to see what was happening than another truck came barreling towards me at a ludicrous speed. Panic set in as I struggled to hit the brakes while simultaneously maneuvering my rig away from the impending collision. But then things took an unexpected turn. Moments before our vehicles met in metallic chaos, the other truck swerved around me and screeched to a halt ahead by mere inches. There he stood once more the man with the scruffy beard and sinister grin. His eyes fixed on me, unblinking and devoid of all emotion. As I reached for my cell phone, it hit me. There was no signal out here in the wilderness. There was no help to be found. My heart raced as if it were trying to outrun impending doom. Eyes locked with my tormentor, it occurred to me that there was only one option left, confront the man and put an end to this nightmare once and for all. I took a deep breath, gripping the steering wheel tightly. Confronting this man would be my only chance at survival, and I had to face it head on. The radio static played as an eerie background music to the scene unfolding before me. As I unbuckled my seat belt and stepped out of the truck, the man's sinister grin grew wider. He seemed to revel in this confrontation, ready for any action I might take. Ignoring the fear gnawing at my insides, I mustered all my courage and shouted, Who are you? What do you want from me? 
The man didn't answer, just stared with those cold, emotionless eyes that had haunted me for so long. My limbs shook uncontrollably as I approached him slowly, still trying to process what was happening. Seeing no other option, I gathered the remaining strength in me and lunged at him, grasping for anything that could help me gain control of the situation. Rather than try to fight back or even dodge my attempt, the man stood there unflinching as my hands connected with his body. We struggled for a moment before he managed to break free from my grasp, his grin never leaving his face. The situation was escalating quickly, and despite the many miles between us and civilization, I couldn't wait any longer for backup that may never come due to lack of signal in this secluded area. Deep down within me a voice echoed what was right all along. Run! My legs started moving before my fear-soaked brain could fully comprehend what's going on. While sprinting away from the impending threat that was my tormentor, I spotted a small cabin off in the surrounding forest, a tiny refuge where maybe just maybe I could find safety. Gaining momentum in my steps while feeling out of breath as adrenaline pumped throughout my body like electricity, every thought focused on reaching that cabin my last hope against the mysterious man pursuing me. I reached the door, furiously throwing it open and stumbling inside. A quick scan of the small, dusty space revealed no one else was there. Miraculously, a landline phone was mounted on the wall. Without hesitation, I dialed 911, hoping against all hope that their signal would reach the nearest emergency services. Minutes dragged by like hours as I stammered through my desperate explanation to the operator, who calmly assured me they'd send help as soon as possible. I breathed a sigh of relief mixed with panic as I looked out of the window. There was no sign of the man, but I could feel him lurking around somewhere in the shadows. The sound of approaching sirens finally broke through my fear-induced focus on what could be hiding in those shadows. Rushing outside to greet my rescuers, I would never forget the scene that awaited me. The police had managed to arrive just in time to catch the man who had been terrorizing me for months. Bloodied and disheveled from an apparent struggle, he looked up at me from his position in handcuffs. His grin remained intact even as law enforcement officers led him away. The nightmare that had haunted me for so long had finally come to an end. Sleepless nights and constant paranoia would slowly subside now that he was gone from our lives. As life returned to normal after several weeks of investigation and paperwork, my heart grieved for those less fortunate who fell victim to this terrible predator. Though my ordeal was now over, their memory remained fresh, a reminder to always listen to that little voice inside when it is warning you danger is near or imminent. With time now to process what had happened and how tight a knot desperation can tie around one's heart when one places their trust in someone sinister without knowing who's behind those emotionless eyes, I realize that life, with its twists and turns, is better spent looking forward, learning from my experiences and never underestimating the true darkness people can harbor within. Working as a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, I had my share of odd experiences. But nothing compares to what happened during that bizarre assignment in the remote wilderness of Alaska a place hiding a deadly secret. My name is Jedediah Bixby, and here's an account of the weirdest and scariest mission I ever encountered. I remember being short-staffed that day, so I paired up with my buddy, Caius Moretti, a fellow search and rescue officer. We received a distress call from a group of lost hikers who had wandered too deep into nature's grip without any trace. Our job was to find them, alive hopefully, and bring them back to safety. Little did we know that we were stepping into something far more sinister than lost hikers in the wilderness. Armed with our forestry maps and rifles, 
we trekked through the dense Alaskan woods. As we ventured deeper, Caius broke the eerie silence with jokes that only he found funny. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything, he chuckled, making light of our grim situation. Taking a break near an old rustic cabin, we discovered large claw marks etched into the wooden walls, distinctly animal-like yet impossibly big. Intrigued yet confused by their size and shape, we continued searching for any sign of the hikers or the mysterious creature responsible for these scratches. Hours passed without significant progress. The sky began to dim as night approached. With each passing minute, it was growing colder, darker, even harder to spot evidence. However, our forest-trained eyes eventually noticed something unusual, strangely mangled carcasses of various animals, all partially consumed as if discarded mid-meal by something ruthless. It was then that I realized— this creature was a brutally efficient hunter and didn't discriminate between its prey, and we were next on its menu. The tempo of our search began to never before experience speeds as the gravity of our situation finally sunk in. The forest noises ceased all at once, and even Caius' usually non-stop banter fell silent. Every rustle, every crack of a twig ramped up the tension. With heartbeats pounding in our ears, we saw it, a hulking creature with matted fur enshrouding a muscular frame. Its burning red eyes pierced through the darkness as it bared fawn-lined jaws that spelled death. With our rifles raised, we fired on the beast, but each round seemed to have minimal to no effect. The creature snarled and lunged at us, rocking the ground with each stride. We scrambled to reload and continue firing but quickly realized we were no match for this relentless predator. In an attempt to flee and save our lives, I yelled to Caius, We need to leave now. Get back up. As we sprinted through the darkness, an unexpected realization hit me. Our only way out led straight back toward the abandoned cabin where those mysterious claw marks had first caught our eye. Clanging through the door of the dilapidated shack, we desperately tried to barricade ourselves inside as best we could, knowing full well this monster would be hot on our heels any second now. While attempting to block out any entrance points, I spotted something that made my heart drop. Scrawled on a tattered piece of paper was a stark message. It hunts us. There is no escape our breaths heavy as we huddled near the corner of the room. Suddenly, I laughed at myself and told Caius that I had actually just remembered another joke but forgot what it was during all this commotion. He looked at me like I was insane but relented either out of compassion or shared fear. With my heart pounding, I turned to Caius and whispered, We have to find a way out of here. He nodded silently and began scanning the room for possible escape routes. As we frantically searched for an exit, we heard the creature's enraged howls getting closer. Just as all hope seemed lost, we discovered a hidden trapdoor under a pile of rubble in the corner. We threw it open to reveal a narrow tunnel beneath the cabin. Without any other options, we scrambled down into the darkness below. Crawling through the cramped tunnel, we hoped the creature wouldn't be able to follow us. The sounds of its fury and destructive rampage filled our ears as it tore apart the cabin above us. Without hesitation, I pulled out my phone to call for help but quickly realized there was no signal down in the depths of this tunnel. Instead, I texted a friend our location and a brief explanation knowing that they would get it as soon as we climbed back to the surface. Progressing through the dark tunnel was slow and disorienting. Eventually, we could no longer hear the creature outside. However, our own labored breaths and skittering sounds echoed ominously around us. As we continued on, with only our phone flashlights illuminating our way, I suddenly noticed Caius had stopped moving behind me. I turned around to see him staring intently at something on the tunnel wall. What is it? I asked anxiously. There are carvings. 
Caius replied, tracing his fingers over deep etchings in the rock wall. They seemed like some form of primitive art, crudely drawn animals, and what appeared to be human figures engaged in various activities. They look old, I whispered nervously, my voice echoing down the tunnel. Ancient even. But what do they mean? We couldn't dwell on their purpose for too long. Our priority was escaping and getting help, even though these ominous carvings nod at the corner of my mind. As we resumed crawling, the tunnel eventually opened up to a larger chamber that seemed like a dead end. In frustration, I banged on the rock wall and lamented our situation trapped with no escape. To our surprise, the wall before us shifted and revealed another narrow passageway. We had found an exit. Emerging from this hidden labyrinth, we found ourselves about a mile away from the cabin. Feeling a small sense of relief knowing we had evaded that monstrous creature, we regained our bearings and made tracks toward town. Before heaving a sigh of relief that we were finally back in civilization, my phone beeped, signaling the arrival of Signal. The text message I had sent earlier must have reached its destination, and help would be on its way soon. As we waited for assistance, Caius and I couldn't shake those unnerving images we found in that hidden tunnel. They seemed far too real, linking directly with the heart-stopping events of tonight. Finally, our friends arrived, stunned by our story but glad to see us alive. As we drove away from the forest, I looked back, catching one final glimpse of those damned woods fading into the night. Though driving away in relative safety now compared to our horrific encounter with that relentless beast, Caius and I knew deep within that something ancient still lurked out there. Marked by those primitive carvings underground, it left not only claw marks on timber but an indelible mark on our lives forever. They say you don't play with monsters because when you try to squeeze out only a little bit of darkness— you are bound to let in a lot more and in escaping this nightmare today. Who knows what terror has been awakened within these woods for us tomorrow. I'm Reginald Peters, a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, and today was nothing like I expected. As I walked through the heavily wooded area of the Olympic National Park in Washington State, I had an uneasy feeling in my gut, but I chalked it up to the dull ache of hunger from skipping breakfast. My mission was simple locate a missing hiker whose distress call came in last night. In all my years of experience, it's rare to find someone too injured to move on their own. As I navigated through the forest— Searching high and low for any trace of the lost person, I stumbled upon an oddly shaped piece of clothing. Oddly enough, it seemed to resemble half a jacket as if something just ripped off an arm and left behind the rest. A faint groan in the distance caught my ear, and all hunger pains were immediately forgotten. Following the sound like a bloodhound on a scent, I hurried towards what seemed to be its source. Finally reaching a small clearing among the dense trees, I found what was left of the missing hiker. The sight would have made anyone turn their stomachs, flesh torn apart in an unsightly manner that spelled torment. As I tried pulling myself together to report this gruesome discovery, an unnatural growl echoed around me. A chill ran down my spine as I caught sight of something darting through the trees. Fast, fierce, and alarmingly large, it resembled no animal that should call this part of America home. Whether it was my foolhardy courage or sheer adrenaline running through me, I reached for my sidearm, always prepared for anything or so I deluded myself to believe. What is that thing? whispered one of our regular camp volunteers named Ellis Walker who had joined me on this rescue operation. To be frank, there were times his sense of humor managed to break the heavy atmosphere, but there was nothing funny about this situation. I don't know, but stay close. Let's fall back to our base, 
and I'll radio for backup. I replied, keeping my eyes locked on the creature's movements. As we backed away slowly, the beast remained focused on us, never wavering for a second. Its blood-curdling gaze made it hard to maintain a clear train of thought as we picked our careful path out of the park. The creature seemed to follow us through the forest, only visible occasionally as it ducked in and out of trees or stalked silently from a distance. What do you think it wants? Ellis questioned under his breath. His shaky voice captured the terror we were feeling, although my pride refused me to admit it openly. Dunno, maybe it enjoys tormenting hikers. I responded in a grim tone as we continued our cautious retreat, making sure not to trip and become easy prey. We finally reached the dense ferns lining our temporary base camp when Ellis suddenly tripped onto something unusual, something that made me feel vastly uncomfortable. Recognizing the odd remains of another seemingly devoured hiker did nothing to calm my racing heart. Blood still visible on the ground, my heart pounded in my ears as I knew we had to call for help. I fumbled for my radio while continuing to move away from the sinister creature lurking nearby. Base, this is Dave's rescue team. We have an emergency. Send back up immediately. I urgently articulated into the radio. A moment of static replied before a voice responded. Jen, one of our co-workers, burst through the noise. Dave? What's going on? She sounded alarmed. That thing in the woods, it's real. I muttered, not believing the words coming out of my mouth. And it's not just a threat. It's already killed someone. There was silence as she processed this horrifying fact. We'll call for reinforcements. Stay close to base and remain armed. As Ellis and I continued our cautious retreat, we heard panic screams from a group of hikers approaching us. Guys! Our tent was destroyed! Something attacked us! exclaimed a petrified hiker, tears streaming down her face. We've seen it too! I said voice shaky as we all hastily moved towards safety. The creature seemed more determined now, slinking closer to our group with each step we took. Backup arrived within an hour. Heavily armed park rangers were sent to patrol the area and search for any remaining survivors they could assist or evacuate. The creature was relentless in its pursuit of new victims. Those who couldn't escape fast enough met a gruesome and terrifying fate. After what seemed like days, although only mere hours had passed, an eerie stillness descended over the area around our base camp. The creature had seemingly vanished, though at what cost? As we tallied up everyone who'd made it back safely and mourned those who hadn't been as fortunate, a sense of unity grew between us all. We'd survived something truly horrifying together, and that bond was not easily broken. We learned devastating news about the victims in the days that followed. Some hikers had been active members of our rescue team, others experienced adventurers who'd only come to the park for a relaxing excursion. Each loss was felt deeply among us, friends, co-workers, and the entire community. An investigation was launched shortly after, hunting parties forming from a mix of park rangers and local hunters. Despite their determination to find and rid the area of this menacing creature, it remained elusive, never stepping into the open or attempting any further attacks while they searched. No one could truly grasp what had happened during those horrific few days, a nightmare we never expected to affect our small community. The stories circulated as rumors mainly, as few outside of our group had seen the beast with their own eyes. With no rational explanation available for its sudden appearance or disappearance, I couldn't help but wonder whether it would ever return, whether another unnerving period awaited us in which beastly shadows pursued human lives on unsuspecting days. Survivors and families grieved for their fallen loved ones as we took comfort in the company of those left standing. Scrutinizing the faces of our teammates, 
We were all searching for the same semblance of closure, reassurance that this horror had truly ended once and for all. But deep within us, a chilling truth lingered. There came no guarantee that these gruesome attacks would never recur, no certainty that an unseen menace wasn't still lurking in the woods, awaiting its next opportunity to strike again. I was sitting in my favorite diner in Colfax, California, sipping coffee and mulling over the recent events in my life. Just yesterday, I'd lost my job as a geologist. Budget cuts, they said. My name is Steve Huxley. It's not the first time I've found myself unemployed. This must be my lucky streak. I mumbled while taking another gulp of coffee. As I finished my meal... The last thing on my mind was some otherworldly creature out to get me. In fact, I was more preoccupied with how I'd pay my bills for the month. A few locals had gathered around the table behind me, talking about strange howling on the edge of town and livestock gone missing overnight. Their lively conversation caught my attention, but I dismissed it as small-town gossip. Time flew and darkness descended upon the town. With nothing better to do, I decided to pack some gear and set off for a walk into the nearby woods. It had been ages since I relished nature's glory under the stars. Surely this would ease my troubled thoughts. Little did I know that an odd and terrifying experience awaited me. As I wandered deeper into the woods, everything appeared ordinary, just the typical tall trees, chilly air and quiet serenity one would expect at night. A sudden bang startled me. Could it have been a hunter's gunshot or a branch snapping? It left me with an uneasy feeling that someone or something was lurking in the darkness. Clambering through vegetation, eventually I stumbled upon what appeared to be a grotesque sight. A mangled deer carcass sprawled amongst muddied leaves. The stench assaulted my senses as flies buzzed around this grisly scene in gory delight. Instinct mandated tread cautiously and retrace my steps, getting tiny hairs to quiver on end with sheer terror. But curiosity bested me. I needed to know what had done this horrific act. Was there a predator stalking the woods so close to town? If so, it was crucial to warn everyone. Further explorations uncovered evidence of more dead animals in similar conditions. None seemed natural. Skulking in shadows, I suddenly spotted a monstrosity far beyond any figment of the human imagination. The vile creature had the rough shape of a canine but was drastically larger and stood on its hind legs. Mottled ashen white skin wrapped around an emaciated frame like a nightmarish cellophane with elongated arms ending in razor-sharp claws. Its face was an abomination, beady red eyes staring straight into my soul, and a gaping maw revealing rows of serrated teeth enthralled by drooling lust for prey. Somehow I managed to turn and sprint away without revealing my presence, at least that's what I hoped. Raging through underbrush in my frantic flight, I prayed it wouldn't see or smell me, before long, arriving back in the heart of town provided temporary relief. Panic citizens needed to be told about the monster lurking nearby. Rushing to the nearest public place, the same diner I'd been in earlier that day, bursting through doors, pounding on tables shouting, Help! Listen to me! There's something out there! The townspeople exchanged disbelieving glances filled with reservations and apparent dismissals, though eventually a line-drenched farmer named Clarence Kershaw lent his ears. It struck me that these were simpler times without limitless ways for distress calls. Overwhelmed by adrenaline-fueled determination, my words came erratically as recounting experiences from those dark woods upon Clarence detailing this ghastly creature adept at killing livestock and leaving mangled remains its wake. Clarence's face went pale, 
realizing that I wasn't joking about the creature. He yelled out to the diner patrons, This is serious. We need to gather a team to confront this thing. The murmurs continued, and everyone in the diner seemed to be on high alert. Some agreed with Clarence, while others were skeptical, claiming that it's some local folklore and not a real threat. Despite the doubts, a group of brave townspeople, including the town sheriff and several farmers and hunters armed with rifles, ventured into the woods to deal with this potential danger. As we moved through the forest, staying close together and on high alert, the eerie silence grew more unnerving. Unexpectedly, screeches echoed through the trees. We halted in our tracks as our eyes searched for whatever horror was lurking just out of sight. Suddenly, a farmer named Jim cried out in pain. The terrifying beast had ambushed him from behind. Its vicious claws slashed through the air as Jim fought for his life. Within seconds, his body was riddled with gashes as blood splattered on those around him. In unison, our firearms roared towards the creature, yet despite our efforts, it evaded most shots but not without injuries. Wounded but still formidable, it snarled at us before launching another horrifying attack. Two more men fell in agony, their anguished cries mixed with shrill screams from the creature itself. Our bullets ripped through its slick skin and injured it even more but didn't stop it entirely. As people nursed their wounds and reloaded their weapons, I spotted a tattoo shop across the street from my hiding spot. I decided to take refuge there not prepared for more carnage. With adrenaline taking over my senses again, I darted to safety just as armed reinforcements arrived. Soon after entering the tattoo shop's dim interior, I discovered an older woman named Millie who claimed to know of the creature. She recounted an ancient tale about a beast called Kernan, a terror that had haunted these lands long before this town existed. Creatures of myth, like Kernan, were so deeply ingrained in local folklore that their legends remained shrouded in mystery. Millie shared illustrations and descriptions from ancient texts to corroborate her claims. Karnan's appearance, attributes, and the trail of carnage it left behind eerily matched the grotesque abomination I had encountered. Suddenly, gunfire tore through the air outside once more. My hopes quickly faded as the agonized screams of more victims filled my ears. It seemed that Kernan has been momentarily weakened but not killed. With profound sadness, I looked at Millie and asked if there was a way to stop Kernan for good. She sighed grimly, informing me that no historical records mentioned any long-term solutions other than temporary methods like traps or poisoning. I knew now that there would be no victor in this bloody battle, only more victims. It seemed Kernan's insatiable lust for blood came with an aptitude for survival and an immense tolerance for pain. Our pursuit against such a primal force was as futile. As the night wore on, and more numbers added to Kernan's victim count, I couldn't imagine how many of my friends and neighbors were now gone forever. We were defeated by an ancient evil born from long-forgotten folklore. The unbearable weight of the tragedy engulfed me as I hid from further carnage. As dawn broke over what had once been a peaceful town, the terrible onslaught of Kernan had finally come to its end. The townspeople cautiously emerged while the serpent-like monster retreated into unfathomable depths beyond our reach. The families mourned those who had perished at the hands of gruesome beasts leaving us to question whether we would ever feel safe in our once tranquil town again. The dreadful shadow of Kernan will forever remain a vivid nightmare for those who witnessed it. I was out exploring with my buddies, Patrick Merriweather and Isaac Evans, when we came across a deserted cabin in an isolated part of Wyoming. 
This location was perfect to set up a base camp for our weekend hikes. I'm Wilfred Walden, by the way, grew up as an only child in an urban part of Baltimore. My love for nature has always been as strong as my sense of humor. This weekend getaway was just what we needed. The cabin appeared abandoned long ago. It was surrounded by the breathtaking forest landscape typical of this area, providing some respite from our stressful city lives. We could already smell the aroma of pine wafting through the air, rejuvenating our senses. Within minutes of settling in, we heard shrieks echoing through the woods. Patrick looked visibly nervous but tried to laugh it off with a clumsy joke about updating his will. We figured it was a fox or another animal having some fun at our expense, so we brushed it off and started unpacking our belongings. The following morning over breakfast, Isaac said he felt like someone or something had been observing us from outside the cabin last night. The unsettling feeling weighed heavy on our minds throughout the day. Over time, we noticed strange claw marks on trees and trampled bushes nearby, signs that an unusually large animal has moved through here not terribly long ago. Curiosity outweighed fear. We all started discussing theories of what sort of creature could have made these trails. As dusk fell upon us one evening, I suggested a quick hike before turning in for the night. We followed one trail that seemed more distinct than others. The path led us deeper into the dense woodland until finally we reached a small clearing, and there it was. We were taken aback at the sight before us, a grotesque creature with coarse hair all over its body and sharp teeth protruding from its colossal mouth, which emitted low guttural sounds. We could see its colossal, muscular arms and legs, each ending in razor-sharp claws the length of our forearms. No words were exchanged among us. We all knew that this terrifying beast was the cause of the distressing marks throughout the forest. Our instinct to call for help was quashed as the creature bellowed savagely, sending an icy shiver down our spines. The remoteness of our location meant that help would take too long to arrive and more crucially, we couldn't provide a reasonable explanation for what we encountered without sounding insane. Pure adrenaline kicked in as we turned and began sprinting along the path back towards our cabin, with the sound of the creature huffing and growling close on our heels. Forgone was my inclination to joke or lighten the atmosphere. We all realized at once how dire our situation had become. We stormed inside the cabin and quickly barricaded the entrance. Patrick tried to steady his breathing, hands shaking uncontrollably as he leaned against a wall for support. The terrifying encounter was still vivid in our minds, a sight that seemed both otherworldly and all too real at the same time. And then, a sudden thud against the cabin door startled us back into reality. The beast had immediately become relentless in its pursuit, trying to claw its way inside with every bit of force it could muster. We scoured the cabin for anything that could be used as a weapon. Our best hope lay in an old hunting rifle we had discovered when first unpacking our supplies. My hands trembled as I held the gun, knowing that I would have only one opportunity to fend off this imposing adversary. I heard Isaac pleading with Patrick to find another way out but soon realized there was no other option. The wooden door groaned under the constant onslaught from this mysterious brute. Its vigorous bounding and battering wouldn't cease until it penetrated our makeshift haven. Time seemed to stand still. My heart pounding in my chest, sweat dripping from my brow, I raised the rifle and prepared to face the unknown. I could feel the very moment our protective wall would give way, allowing the sinister creature entry to carry out whatever horrifying intentions it possessed. The door finally burst open, revealing the horrifying creature we had only briefly encountered earlier. It was a mix of animal and human features, grotesque and twisted in form. Its fur-covered body, muscular and hunched over, 
exposed sharp claws at the ends of elongated limbs. But the most terrifying part was its face, a horrible hybrid of animalistic rage and terrifying human-like intelligence. I shouted at Patrick and Isaac to find any possible way out as I raised my rifle and fired a shot directly at the creature's head. To my utter shock, it did not deter the beast. It only enraged it further. Patrick screamed as he was attacked first, his arms desperately trying to fend off the creature as it tore into him with its horrible claws. Isaac and I were too panicked to help him effectively. We scrambled towards a small window near the back of the cabin, shattering it quickly to make our escape. Suddenly, there was an eerie silence inside the cabin. The attack on Patrick had stopped. Isaac jumped through the broken window first, disappearing into the dense woods outside. I hesitated for a moment before following suit. I knew deep down that we should have helped Patrick, but our fear made us run like cowards instead. The guilt would later consume me. Blindly heading deeper into the forest without a solid plan, I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite in disarray. The remnants of a camper's luggage caught my attention. Something in particular stood out, a book called Encyclopedia of Mythology and Folklore. I opened it to discover various illustrations depicting creatures of legend. My entire body froze when I saw a drawing that looked strikingly similar to our attacker from earlier. It was identified as Cernabog literally, the black god, a malevolent being known in Eastern European folklore. As terror gripped me anew, I frantically fumbled for my phone in hopes of calling for help, realizing that I had left it back at the cabin in the midst of our desperate escape. The bleak reality settled in, no help would arrive. Suddenly, I heard heavy footsteps approaching. My mind raced, contemplating my next move. If engaging the creature was out of question and calling for help was impossible, my only option left was to hide and pray that I remained unseen. I found a small makeshift shelter nearby, just big enough to conceal me and hastily crawled inside. There, I lay down, barely breathing, my heart pounding in my ears as the footsteps drew closer. I stayed there for what felt like an eternity. Finally, the thudding steps retreated into the distance as dawn began to break. I mustered the courage to leave my hideout and began making my way back to the cabin. Reaching the cabin, I found it eerily empty. Patrick was gone, although a trail of blood hinted at his terrible fate. Then one crushing realization set in. Isaac never made it out either. I sank to my knees, sobbing. Friends lost, hunted by this monster from folklore. I couldn't grasp how my life had fallen apart so quickly. Then a spark of resolve sparked within me. Were it not for that book on folklore lying coincidentally at that abandoned campsite, we would have never known about Cernabog. Our primal fears wouldn't have had a name. With newfound determination and a sick sense of tribute to those who didn't make it out alive, I picked up a shard of broken glass from the shattered window earlier. My goal now became singular. Banish this wretched beast from existence before it could claim more lives. With teary eyes and an improbable plan forming in my mind, I stepped outside to confront Cernabog one last time, hoping against hope that maybe... Just maybe, we'd have one last fighting chance. This happened to me a decade ago in the dense wilderness of Idaho at an off-the-grid campsite, where I went alone to escape the hustle of city life. My name is Orville Drexler, and I recently got divorced. My plan was to stay here for some time and let nature heal me. The first person I encountered there was Agnieszka Pierce, an unusual woman who lived close by in a wooden cabin that resembled a tool shed. 
she shared with me stories of local legends while munching on wild berries. One day, as we walked together examining animal tracks near the creek, she seemed uneasy. She began to recount whispers of a terrifying creature that lurked in these woods, though she had never seen it herself. People often went missing, she confided in me. Had I not been so skeptical, I might have noticed the red flag sooner. I continued enjoying my peaceful days, only occasionally finding temporary unease when my memory recalled the ominous words shared by Agnieszka. That was until the fateful night when I was startled awake by a gut-wrenching scream carrying through the trees. Yet, at that moment, no one else seemed nearby to be asking for help. Still groggy from sleep, I brushed it off as just a figment of my imagination. The very next morning, Agnieszka stopped by my campsite looking pale and troubled. She revealed that a person had gone missing from a nearby camp the night before. Disbelief washed over me as reality aligned eerily with her tales. Despite this synchronicity, Deep down I remained reluctant to believe in anything supernatural or otherworldly. Days later, we hiked deep into the forest guided only by our curiosity until we stumbled across an abandoned hunting shack. Curiosity led us inside where we found various weapons like rifles and knives scattered chaotically throughout the room. The thick layer of dust suggested that no one had been there for years. Close to twilight, we reached the edge of a ravine. A strong stench filled the air, making our stomachs turn. This vile scent accompanied the shocking sight before us, a mangled body left behind as if it was a mere toy cast aside by a bored child. It was then that we discovered the grim reality. Someone or something was brutally killing people in these woods. Not knowing what to do, we stumbled back towards the campsite with heavy hearts while the night thickened around us. Our sense of safety evaporated as we realized that we were potentially sharing this space with a bloodthirsty beast. After our gruesome find, fearful conversations populated the campfire nights. People murmured of seeing a shadowy figure leaping through the trees on all fours at remarkable speeds. Its elongated limbs appeared out of place on its muscular body and gleaming rows of sharp teeth glinted ominously within its elongated, grotesque snout. This creature didn't utter even a single word as if intentionally depriving us of verifiable information. One by one, more people disappeared from our once vibrant community until only Agnieszka and I remained. Desperation drove us to make a plan so dangerous that it should have been unthinkable. We decided to confront this beast ourselves. Armed with rifles from the abandoned shack, we set off into the darkness of what would ultimately be our last evening on this suffocating earth. As we wandered through unfamiliar territory, Agnieszka suddenly tripped over something large in her path and fell forward onto her knees. My heart sank into my stomach when I pulled out my flashlight and saw what had befallen her. Another careless footstep would have taken us directly into the gaping ribcage of another lost soul among these trees. The discovery made it painfully clear that whatever hunted us was still nearby, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. With a renewed sense of urgency, Agnieszka and I continued venturing deeper into the unknown, rifles at the ready. Our only goal was to eliminate this threat, whatever it might be. We could not call for help. The others were already gone, and there was no one left to save us. We walked cautiously, listening for any signs of movement or danger. In the distance, we could hear a faint rustling beyond the dense foliage. As we came closer to the sound, we saw an enormous creature looming in front of us. Its leathery skin stretched taut over rippling muscles as it prowled on all fours through the forest floor. Its grotesque snout twitched, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth that gleamed beneath the moonlight. Hands shaking, I called out to Agnieszka just as she aimed her rifle at it, waiting for an opportune moment to strike. 
Moments before she could pull the trigger, the creature charged. It mauled her with terrifying speed, leaving her body broken and lifeless on the forest floor. Frozen with shock and grief for my departed friend, I tried my best to steady my hands as I aimed my rifle at the beast once more. It snarled menacingly and lunged towards me, enraged by our presence in its territory. I fired a single shot with my trembling hands just as it tackled me to the ground. To my disbelief and relief, it convulsed in pain before slumping lifelessly onto me. The final bullet had struck a vital organ or artery sending it into its sudden death. With great effort, I managed to push the now motionless body off myself before looking around, trying to find some semblance of safety or sanity in this terrible place. I wanted nothing more but to leave these accursed woods immediately. Agnieszka. She didn't deserve this fate. None of us did. But there was nothing else I could do but carry on with my life, knowing that whatever this creature was may cease to terrorize others because of our actions tonight. A few days later, safely away from the woods in a small motel, I researched what the creature could have been. I didn't believe in folklore or mythical creatures, but the horrors we faced were far from a simple animal attack. Eventually, I stumbled upon a detailed article about skinwalkers and shapeshifters in obscure cultures. Could such a creature really exist? Could it have been the cause behind all the disappearances and gruesome deaths in our former community? All rational thought told me it was a nightmarish fantasy at best, yet deep down in me, something pushed my belief towards these harrowing legends. This newfound knowledge filled me with dread and unwilling fascination. I made the choice to never return to those woods. The memories of my lost friends, especially Agnieszka's sacrifice, would remain unforgotten as long as I lived. My heart heavy with sorrow, grief, and fear, I decided to move far away from the area where we once resided. Starting anew elsewhere seemed like the only viable option for me to move forward with my life. While I could never be entirely sure about what we had encountered that night, or why it chose to prey on us specifically, one thing was clear. Some truths are too terrifying and dangerous to seek out or comprehend. In an attempt to honor Agnieszka and all those who lost their lives to this monstrous adversary, I committed myself to giving back where I could. Volunteering in various charities and working towards making communities safer brought me solace in leaving behind that which almost took my life as well. As time passed by and my disdain for morbid curiosities faded with age, an undying hope grew within me, a hope that no one else would ever experience the cruel malevolence of the nightmare that I could only assume was a skinwalker or shapeshifter. It was our unwitting bravery that stopped the mysterious beast, but it was my determination to make a difference that would prevent anything like this from plaguing us again. This happened to me a few weeks ago, working at a remote cabin in Yukon River Valley, Alaska. My name is Lennox Gorin, and I befriended one of the local hunters, Celso Tarquin. We had settled into our evening routine, discussing life and laughter over a bottle of whiskey. There was a growing unease among the locals due to unsolved missing persons cases in recent weeks. The whole atmosphere changed when we received a disturbing phone call from Celso's father. His hysterical voice recounted a horrific scene of his wife brutally attacked. Panicking, Celso and I rushed to their house. As we entered, we found his father crying in the corner, his face marred by fear. The living room was covered in blood, chunks of flesh strewn across the floor. His mother lay grotesquely mutilated on the couch, her body torn apart beyond recognition. Celso called emergency services as I dialed the police. 
Both were put on hold due to high call volumes that night. We borrowed guns from his father's cabinet and began a search for the attacker or any indication about what may have caused this gruesome crime. Hours passed without answers. Our weary footfalls accompanied only by distant howling wind, as if warning us away from untold horrors lurking ahead. Finally, something broke our search, movement in the trees nearby. A quick glimpse revealed large dark shapes shifting through branches with unnatural speed and agility. Terrified, we aimed our weapons at the monstrous figure towering before us, its skin a sickly shade of gray-green and unnervingly smooth, elongated limbs covered in subtle ridges and bony protrusions, its eyes displayed intelligent but malevolent intent, and around its maw clung tendrils of sinew, as if trailing hungrily behind an endlessly open mouth craving more sustenance. Our instinct screamed desperately for escape, yet curiosity held our frozen fingers to the trigger lock. We both fired shots at the creature, but it seemed unfazed, dodging with uncanny agility. We stumbled upon the realization that there was more than one of them when we cornered by multiple creatures blocking every exit possible. Outnumbered and terrified, we somehow managed to escape their grasp and sprint back to his father's house, spurred by adrenaline and a foreign fear that overwhelmed us completely. The police eventually arrived, investigating both with concern and disbelief. The station received several similar reports that night, attacks so violent yet utterly inconsistent with the work of any known predators in the region. Our story was dismissed as an exaggeration born from disoriented panic. But for weeks afterwards, Celso and I haunted by sleepless nights, tortured by ceaseless questions spiraling into madness. What were those creatures? Why were they plaguing this quiet part of Alaska? How many more lives would be lost? Slowly, as if lured into oblivion by our inability to find closure our regular conversations turned toward revenge. Enough was enough. No one else should suffer like we had or witness such horror again. The two of us hatched an ill-conceived plan, determined more than ever, doomed, to face these creatures head-on, even if it meant losing everything we held dear in the process. As we searched for our elusive prey, we collected evidence lending credibility to our story, bent trees, shredded clothing, mangled gore. Each day blurred indistinguishably into another without progress, nor respite from the nightmares clawing at the edges of our sanity. Lennox and Celso spent months stalking these mysterious beings all over Alaska, finding abandoned cabins ripped apart as if flayed apart by a vicious hurricane, butchered livestock drained entirely of blood, Silent crying witnesses hidden in plain sight under bleak skies scorched crimson by fits of pain and anguish that refused to fade away. Tired, bruised, and bleeding, Celso and I continued our pursuit. We had become obsessed, consumed by the goal to end this terror that loomed over our town. Our days were filled with futile searches, while our nights were haunted by demonic nightmares. Inexplicably drawn to the location where we had encountered them, we retraced our steps in the hope of stumbling upon a clue. One fateful night, as rain pelted down and nature added a sense of impending doom to our already dark surroundings, we stumbled upon an unlikely ally. As we trudged through a thick forested area near a creek, we encountered another survivor a bear hunter who also sought to end the reign of terror these creatures had unleashed. Without hesitation, he shared his story. The beast attacked him during one of his hunting trips, leaving him with scars no hunter should bear. We found his descriptions eerily similar to those anomalous creatures stalking our nightmares. They smelled like rotting flesh and earth but moved with unnatural speed. Together with the hunter, we formed an uneasy alliance, three beings united against an unknown foe that tormented us relentlessly. We decided to search for these beasts together, 
the task felt lighter with companions who understood each other's pain. Days turned into weeks as we pursued them through rugged landscapes shaped by merciless weather. We trailed their every footstep. Desperate calls for help echoed in vain through seemingly endless wilderness. Then, finally, in a starless Alaskan night draped in foreboding darkness, we stumbled upon them again. Their faces twisted with rage and bloodlust, they fixated on me, surging forward as if propelled by palpable hatred. It was at this moment when I realized that instead of hunting these creatures down, it was they who led us on a wild goose chase, right into their lair. Pure instinct took over as I raised my firearm, shouting to Celso and the hunter to stand back while simultaneously firing. The shot hit the creature's shoulder, but my action only served to enrage it further. Incredible speed and gore met my eyes as the beast charged, knocking me to my knees and shattering bones within. The fatal mistake had just been committed. They now knew what weapons we possessed. The creature's eyes bore into Alma and the hunter, their attention momentarily swayed from me. In one swift motion, they pounced on my companions and tore their bodies apart with gleeful abandonment, leaving behind a massacre of viscera. With aching bones broken by the sheer force of this unknown enemy, I scuffled through muck and glass, ignoring the pain with each hurried movement. My lungs burned for air as I willed through obstacles. Exhausted, I stumbled upon a crude road nearby. Although I had escaped death, my heart weighed heavy with sorrow at leaving Celso's mangled body behind. A single thought reverberated in my mind. Why didn't we call for help? Finally safe from their grasp but lost in desolation near rising daylight's edge, I sought shelter. Help arrived soon enough as some passing hunters happened upon a disheveled me and spirited me away from this accursed place. As I recuperate under their care, I look back at their twisted faces haunting memories just past, their dark orbs fixated on Alma moments before her demise. They were no ordinary creatures. It was evident in their unnatural agility and cruelty that struck terror in even our most primal instincts. My assumption remains accurate. Indeed, these beings were more than mere beasts but shapeshifters or perhaps skinwalkers summoned from folklore's darkest pages. Facing such grotesque villains' incomprehensible existence threatens what little sanity remains in me as sleepless nights continue to plague my once steady mind. The massacre forever seared onto my retina serves as a chilling reminder on why some mysteries are better left unsolved. This happened to me twenty years ago up in the dense woods of Maine, where I worked as a forest ranger. My name is Artie Valdez, and for the most part, my job was pretty mundane. One day I was patrolling an area known for illegal logging. I'd already talked with some folks on my way into work, which started my day with a good laugh. As I plodded along the trails and muddy paths, there was nothing out of the ordinary until I came across an abandoned campsite. Oddly enough, there were personal belongings scattered around but no sign of the occupants. Reminded of stories involving disappearing hikers in these woods, I radioed headquarters to report my findings but received no response. Signal interference or dead zones were unlikely here, so I made a mental note to figure out why later. The situation took a turn when I found what looked like human blood smeared on a tree trunk nearby. At that moment, something darted behind me with incredible speed. Before I knew it, the creature submerged itself into the undergrowth. I stayed alert and primed to defend myself as my heart thumped in my chest. In the distance, a trembling scream echoed through the forest. It suddenly struck me that this could have been a park visitor who's wandered off course. Perhaps they were in trouble. As time went on and dust drew closer, 
I stumbled across more grisly crime scenes mutilated wildlife deep within the woods and what appeared to be increasingly violent signs of struggle. Wondering why our unit hadn't been notified about these accidents filled me with concern mixed with escalating panic. Trekking deeper into the darkness, my flashlight illuminated a massive figure looming over me larger than any bear or creature I had encountered before in these woods. It was standing on two legs but possessed powerful hind muscles resembling those of a big cat or predatory beast. For with reddish-black hues began at its hunched shoulders, ran down a grotesque spinal ridge, and covered its sinewy tail. Curved claws protruded from its brutish hands, which dripped with the same human blood I had discovered earlier. The creature bared its jagged teeth, releasing a primal growl that put decades' worth of fear into me. My instinct to run was strong, but my attempts to call for backup were ongoing efforts met with dead air instead of communication. Uncertain of what to do next but fearing for my life, I reached for the gun I'd brought along just in case. An unexpected shot rang out through the forest. To my surprise, it wasn't me who fired— it was another forest worker named Jessamine Bailey who'd been alerted by the commotion from afar. The creature emitted a painful howl as it hastily retreated further into the darkness. She came to my aid, her wide eyes taking in the aftermath of the confrontation. With mere seconds to spare before that beast regrouped and attacked again, we braced ourselves and focused on coordinating our defense. We knew we were in dire trouble, and the chances of making it out alive were slipping away with each passing instant. Jessamine and I formed makeshift barricades while exchanging stories about park disappearances. She'd taken her own notes on multiple unexplained vanishings over the years. We agreed we might be dealing with something entirely new, something we couldn't understand or identify. As a chilling breeze swept through the woods around us, we heard low growls simmering in the shadows beyond our flashlight beams. The faces of panicked campers and their now-abandoned campsite rushed through our minds. Recalling their personal items left behind earlier that day was what fueled our resolve against the abomination that now threatened us both. We scanned the area, trying to predict the creature's next move. It was large, about eight feet tall, with coarse dark fur covering its muscular body. Its teeth were sharpened, dripping with what looked like a mix of saliva and blood. When it moved, we couldn't believe the speed and agility it demonstrated despite its massive size. I realized I hadn't tried to call for help since Jessamine arrived. I pulled out my radio again frantically trying to establish contact with anyone who could assist us. The radio crackled to life. Hello? Can anyone hear me? We need help. I shouted into the device. The response was static at first, but after a few tense moments, a voice broke through. This is the ranger station. Where are you? Jessamine quickly provided our location while I continued to survey our surroundings. Suddenly, the creature lunged at us from behind a cluster of trees. It clawed at Jessamine's makeshift barricade, leaving deep gashes in the wood. Run! I yelled as Jessamine grabbed her weapon. Fearing for our lives, we dashed through the forest, desperately trying to escape the monstrous creature that pursued us. The terrain was rough, and under other circumstances, we would have had difficulty navigating it. Now, in sheer terror with adrenaline coursing through our veins, it seemed an impossible feat. The attack continued relentlessly. We desperately tried to keep ahead of it but heard its growls inching closer and closer. Ahead of us lay a ravine, a dangerous leap but possibly our only chance of escape. Realizing we had no other options, we exchanged a glance that communicated an unspoken agreement before jumping into the abyss below us. I hit the ground hard and stumbled momentarily, 
My trained body reflexively adjusted itself for momentum control as I caught Jessamine's hand amid her wince of pain from landing on her ankle at an awkward angle. Not much further until help arrives. I reassured her as she limped alongside me, our hands tightly clasped. At that moment, we heard the creature skid to a halt and growl with anger. It remained on the other side of the ravine, glaring at us as we gained distance from it. It stared at us for what felt like an eternity, its eyes filled with hatred and bloodlust. After another tense moment, it turned away and disappeared into the depths of the forest, leaving us bone-chillingly terrified but grateful for our survival. We finally reached a forest clearing where members of our ranger team had gathered after receiving Jessamine's message. While they debriefed us on what had happened, we mourned over those who didn't make it out alive, Pete, whom we had found devoured mere hours earlier, and Lucy, a fellow forest worker who'd been reported missing two days prior. In the following weeks, several investigations were launched to uncover the source of these horrifying events. No concrete evidence was discovered, only speculation about the possible existence of a previously undiscovered species fueled by park disappearances and encounters passed down through generations. We couldn't confirm any theories or identify what the creature was, but Jessamine and I knew that something dangerous still lurked within the forest's shadows. Each day we returned to work wary and ever vigilant, hoping to protect others from suffering the same fate as those who'd been lost to that merciless predator. And with every gruesome attack or chilling encounter that followed in its wake, we were reminded of our own harrowing escape from death. We were left haunted by our memories, but profoundly grateful to have survived that which so many others hadn't. Flashes of lightning threw my lookout tower into sharp relief against the Oregon wilderness. I wasn't fond of storms, but it came with the territory. My name is Merritt, a fire lookout entrusted with guarding stretches of timber-rich land. Holed up in my tower, the isolation got to me, more so during these violent tempests. My only company was a handheld radio and books left by predecessors too bored or too scared to stay. On nights like this, the wind howled creating sounds resembling whispers that snuck through the cracks in my cabin. Hailstones pelted the roof as if angry fists demanded entry. It started with a single report, a hiker missing somewhere below my jurisdiction. Not uncommon, but unsettling nonetheless. The weather hindered search teams. I tuned to their stations, hearing fragments over the static. Visibly altered trails, blood but no body. The next day dawned clear, nature's treachery forgotten beneath azure skies. A man named Halvard appeared beneath my tower as I surveyed through binoculars for any signals of fire or distress among the conifers. He had an unsettling demeanor, claiming he was looking for his friend, the missing hiker perhaps. When he left as suddenly as he arrived, an unease settled in my stomach. Evenings were spent carefully charting any anomalies in foliage patterns from my vantage point. That's when things turned grim. A small clearing usually teeming with wildlife lay deserted. Appearances proved deceptive in a setting where survival mattered most. Days after Halvard's visit, another storm rolled in with a vengeance. Lightning strikes were close enough for me to feel their electricity in my teeth. After one particularly loud clap of thunder, my radio crackled to life with a panic-stricken voice. It was Halvard, and he was close. Something's stalking me. His breath was ragged between words hammered out in terror. I grabbed a flashlight intending to help trace his steps. Breaking protocols seemed trivial compared to human life. As I descended into uneasy darkness fueled by altruism, 
I realize that helping others at times put one at risk themselves. Through gaps between trees, I shone my light onto scarlet marks, signs of struggle. This wasn't nature's artistry, but something sinister at play amidst these serene giants thrusting towards the heavens. Seeking halberd meant unraveling clues, warding off unwanted conclusions, circling my mind like vultures over carrion. Missteps disguised as good intentions led many astray here. Tracing his path became harder. Frantic darts turned into methodical steps as I approached a clearing halberd described. The radio buzzed silent halfway there. As lightning illuminated the ground before me like strobe lights on a grim dance floor, shadows formed and reformed shaping doubt into certainty. A body lay ahead divorced from life by forceful means evident even at this unintended crime scene. Void of visible identifiers save for clothes whispering familiarity. This couldn't be who I thought. But intuition screamed what reason refused to accept. Halvard's voice rang anew, albeit closer, without any semblance of distance or electronic medium. A whisper now amidst nature's unrest asking for assistance that would arrive too late. An echo of last resort born from desperation fraying into silence. I pressed the radio button. No response. The dead silence amplified the urgency of the situation. I needed to reach the clearing. My pace quickened until I stumbled upon the body. It was halvard, lifeless. For a moment, I stood frozen, processing the scene. Instinct pushed me to check for signs of life, but it was clear he was gone. I fumbled for my phone, hands shaking. As I dialed emergency services... I scanned the area for any sign of movement. Trees swayed innocently in the wind, no indicator of the lurking danger. The operator's voice cut through my concentration. What's your emergency? I hurriedly explained, concealing panic. Halvard is dead. In the woods west of Old Birch Road. We're sending a team now, she assured me. Stay on the line. While waiting for help to arrive, noises from deeper in the woods caught my attention, a rustling distinct from wildlife foraging or nocturnal critters. Safety became an utmost concern. My decision not to venture further sprang not from cowardice but survival. This entity displayed violence and strength surpassing any animal I knew. As time trickled by agonizingly slow, Distant sirens grew louder until red and blue lights flickered between trees, a beacon of outside reality penetrating this nightmarish ordeal. First responders swarmed around, securing the area. Questions poured over me like relentless rain. What did you see? One officer asked. Nothing, I replied honestly. The truth was suffocating because there was nothing tangible to report just visceral fear suggesting something grotesque and calculating moved with purpose against us. Hours later, investigators pieced together a preliminary profile of our predator, large based on footprints near Halvard's body, powerful from how Halvard had been moved post-mortem, and smart since it avoided leaving behind clear evidence. In their search— they found remnants shredded clothing snagged on underbrush hinted at gray fur or flesh. Nothing conclusive, but certainly not human. Weary and overwhelmed by grief, I returned home as dawn approached with a burden heavier than fatigue. Halvard had become a victim in an unfathomable realm that had clashed with ours. In memory of Halvard, authorities cordoned off that part of the forest and placed warning signs with words that seemed inadequate given what might lurk within those ancient woods, still not understanding what hunted us last night. Ever have one of those days where everything goes sideways before you've even finished your first cup of coffee? That was my reality just a few ticks past sunrise, 
as I clocked in at the secluded facility nestled discreetly within the dense cover of Montana's Lolo National Forest. My name, not that it matters much amongst the covert circles I run in, is Ripley Voss. I'm a biologist, but not the garden variety kind. I work on genetic experiments so seeker, to even mentioning them too loud might warrant a stern visit from uptight suits. The day began like any other. I was triple-checking sequence alignments when Harlan Coates, our tech guru with the fingers of a concert pianist and the hair of a wild man, stormed in. Ripley, he gasped. Delphine found something gruesome on the west perimeter. Delphine Pratchett, ever the stoic field operative rarely flinched at anything nature threw her way. We geared up quickly, matching black cargo pants and sturdy boots whispering across linoleum as we paced through sterile corridors. Outside, the sun was too bashful to pierce the fortified pines shielding us from prying eyes. Delphine met us by the main gate, her expression grim. Follow me, she said curtly. We didn't need more prodding than that. By the time we reached what Delphine had discovered, the first whispers of horror were already unfurling within me, a sight as disgusting as it was baffling. A deer sprawled across our path but mangled in such bizarre fashion that it looked more like a cruel parody of taxidermy gone wrong. Harlan quipped an inappropriate joke about venison going to waste, inappropriate being his brand, but nobody laughed. We all felt it. Something wasn't right. With Harlan mumbling to himself and Delphine scanning for more clues, either daring to verbalize their dread, I crouched down beside the carcass for a closer inspection. No ordinary predator had wrought this devastation. No human could achieve such precision with such savagery. Suddenly aware of how exposed we stood in a swatch of forest far away from any semblance of safety, I stood up briskly and checked my sidearm, a habit drilled into me over years on this unorthodox job. Not that a gun always helped against what nature might dream up. I don't like this, Delphine muttered, reaching for her own weapon discreetly concealed beneath her jacket. Let's report back, I suggested when suddenly an ear-splitting roar shattered our uneasy conference a sound no known creature could claim rights to. We turned instinctively toward its source, hearts impaled by primal fear as incongruent thoughts collided in our minds. Was this linked to our experiments? A byproduct of our tamperings we hadn't foreseen? The arsenal under our fingertips provided cold comfort against unknown monstrosities born from nature's wrath or perhaps our own arrogance. Pushing through branches that snagged at us with spider-like fingers, we sought sight of whatever beast owned that harrowing cry. Just then, Coates yelped as his foot found vacuous earth where solid ground should be. He staggered but recovered quick enough not to kiss the dirt face first. It wasn't long before we came upon another chilling scene, one more hapless animal distorted beyond recognition but this time with evidence suggesting an intelligent yet feral perpetrator at play. The air turned heavy with silent apprehension as daylight began its retreat, a tactical failure on our part not securing the area before dusk crept upon us. Our hand signals spoke volumes, spread out but stay within eyeshot, the difficulty being every shadow now seemed pregnant with malice waiting to breach its umber cage. I scanned every visual frame my eyes could capture fearing a repeat of literature's fabled wendigos or skinwalkers. Though my rational mind screamed there had to be logic behind these perverted displays nature usually didn't dabble in modern horror mythos. We pressed on, keeping close but cautious of ambush. Sanchez motioned for a retreat back to the base. The need for reinforcements was clear as our numbers and weaponry were inadequate for confrontation. Signals crackled to life in our radios. Henderson spoke first. Base, we have an unknown hostile. Request immediate backup at our coordinates. 
Static hyster response. Copy that. ETA 20 minutes. Panic held us when branches snapped nearby. I sighted the outline of something large and swift among the trees. Body lean and powerful, covered with matted fur like a bear but movements too graceful, too predatory. Coats signaled from a distance, pointing to a lower clearing. Look! I followed his gesture, noting body parts stretched between trees. We knew then what had screamed earlier— an animal, or even worse, human met its end. Our circle tightened as darkness grew near. Lights flickered on weapons and headgear revealing further shredded foliage and traces of blood leading deeper into the forest. No one spoke. The reality spoke for itself. The wait for reinforcements became a haunting vigil. A shape darted between shadows— silent except for faint rustles betraying its position. It happened in seconds. Coates screamed as the creature leaped. Claws sliced through the air as he fired blindly. I saw it then in full view, limbs disproportionate in length giving advantage in both reach and speed against its prey, eyes reflected haunting red glints from our lights. Chaos ensued as bullets found their mark but not sufficiently to deter the creature's onslaught on coats. Realization dawned. This creature wasn't just defending territory. It hunted us methodically. Sanchez shouted orders above gunfire noise. Fall back to the clearing. Keep your sights aligned. We retreated in formation while the creature pursued relentlessly. Injuries mounted among us. Henderson took a severe blow trying to cover our escape. Reinforcements arrived with louder gunfire and brighter lights pushing the beast back into shadows that birthed it. Regrouped at base we accounted for losses. Henderson didn't make it out alive. Beside his fate lay heavy on our minds. The next day brought armed teams and trackers combing through detailed reports at hand. No sign of the beast except torn environs speaking silently of its reign of terror. Debriefings followed with experts proposing theories on possible species variants or mutations caused by natural anomaly or human intervention gone wrong. We kept silent vigils, weapons prime not knowing whether the creature lay in wait or if we'd invaded its solitary domain triggering its savage defense mechanism. In end my thoughts often circle back to these woods and what might still lurk within, a predator's no folklore or story could ever have envisioned yet undeniably real in nature's twisted scheme or our folly. October 10th, 2012 It started with a job. Figured it'd be an easy in and out, mapping some old logging trails up in the Washington Cascades for a timber company. Get paid, spend a few weeks in the woods, sounded perfect to me. Name's Cole, by the way. Ex-Army, did some wilderness training stuff after. Living off-grid ain't a hobby for me, it's a skill set. Landed myself a sweet little campsite by a creek, real secluded. First few days went smooth. Work was straightforward. The woods were the usual thick, rain-soaked Pacific Northwest tangle. Nights were quiet, except for the normal critter noises. But by the end of that first week, things started feeling off. Wasn't anything obvious, more a prickling at the back of my neck. That gut instinct you get after too many patrols in bad territory— then I found the elk. It was half submerged in the creek, not more than a hundred yards from my camp. Hide stripped clean off, the meat carved away like it had been butchered. Didn't see any tracks that made sense, not with the way the carcass was torn up. Figured maybe a cougar got lucky, dragged its kill somewhere safer. Still, I slept with my rifle close that night. Couple days later, I was way off trail, marking a stand of old growth the company wanted surveyed. 
found myself in a small clearing where something big had gone through. Branches snapped high up. The ground churned to mud. And there, in the prints, were these massive, clawed footprints. Definitely no bear or anything I recognized. The thing that made them was strong, heavy. I started backtracking, following the trail of destruction. That's when I heard it, the crack of a branch snapping, just ahead in the trees. I froze, rifle raised, but there was nothing to see in the thick undergrowth. The forest fell silent. Then, from somewhere behind me, came a low snarl that turned my blood cold. I turned, scanning the trees. That's when I saw it, crouched on a moss-covered boulder. Huge, looked like a mix of man and wolf, but twisted and wrong. Its skin was stretched tight over bone, almost translucent. Its eyes burned yellow in the dim light. We stared at each other, maybe ten seconds that felt like forever. My finger found the rifle's trigger, but something held me back. It wasn't just animal instinct, it was deeper, a primal dread that screamed at me this ain't natural. The creature lunged, and I fired on instinct. I remember the roar of my rifle, the bark shattering from trees. The creature jerked, then vanished into the undergrowth. I stumbled back, breathing ragged, heart pounding like a drum solo. Didn't stop to think just emptied the rifle in the direction I thought it had gone with a desperate yell. I knew then it wasn't over. Whatever that thing was, I'd pissed it off. Back at my camp, I packed up everything I could carry and booked it out of there. Didn't stop running until I found a road, flagged down a trucker who gave me a wide-eyed look but drove me to the nearest town. Called the job and sick, told the timber company to forget about me mapping those woods. Figured they'd write me off as some nature kook. Didn't care. Never went back to the Cascades. That snarl echoes in my head sometimes, especially at night. Folks say Bigfoot's a myth, an old wives' tale to scare kids. I saw something out there, something that ain't in any guidebook. And in those woods, deeper than maps show and darker than men go, I reckon the locals have a name for it, the Wendigo. Let me tell you, the aftermath wasn't pretty. Couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, jumped at every shadow. Nightmares plagued me, the creature's blazing eyes, the hunger in its snarl. Tried to tell people, but they looked at me like I was crazy. Drank myself stupid for a while, trying to erase the memory. Didn't work. Eventually, I picked myself up, drifted from place to place. Never stay anywhere too long. Keep a rifle loaded, sleep with one eye open. I ain't the same guy who headed into those woods. Maybe that cold died back there in the clearing. Maybe the thing in the trees took a piece of me. But here's the thing about monsters. Once you know they're real, you can never go back to pretending they're not. Word gets around, even in the off-grid crowd. Met a guy in Montana last year, a Lakota elder at an off-season powwow. Heard my story and just nodded. Told me there are things in the deep places, old things with names only whispered around dying fires. We traded tobacco shared a flask under the stars. He said, You saw a walker between worlds. Best you run and don't look back. Guess I'm still running. I always found comfort in the predictable sounds of the forest as I patrolled the trails of Sequoia National Park. My name is Rowan Cates, a park ranger charged with keeping these ancient woods safe for both visitors and wildlife alike. That particular day, I stumbled upon a scene unlike any other. Deep within the park's heart lay an abandoned campsite, tents shredded and belongings scattered as though a whirlwind had torn through. 
A call for help would have been logical, but the silent stillness of the forest somehow convinced me that whatever had occurred was isolated and past. With this thought, the memory of my father's advice echoed in my mind, stern and uncompromising on self-reliance, ever since he left when I was twelve. As I examined the campsite, my senses strayed to a set of large, unfamiliar tracks leading away into the thicket. Not bear or deer, they were like nothing I'd ever encountered in my years of experience. The creature responsible must have been enormous. Clawed feet had dug deep into the earth, leaving behind a trail of broken foliage and an unsettling air of mystery. Against better judgment— and spurred by an ingrained sense of duty to protect these woods, I followed. The chase led me deeper into terrain most rangers seldom tread, a forgotten slice of wilderness where sunlight barely pierced the canopy. The tracks grew fresher as I progressed. Dread crept along my spine, yet I pressed on. A sudden rustling ahead snapped me to attention, one hand instinctively reaching for the pistol at my hip. Through a clearing, I got my first glimpse of it, tall and gaunt with mottled fur that seemed to drink in the shadows its back arched unnaturally, as though bearing unseen burdens. A faceless head turned towards me, limbs twisted and angles written off by nature. Speechless terror wrapped around my throat tighter than any noose. My mind raced for explanations but found none. This was no bear or creature known to textbooks or field guides. It was a living impossibility that watched me with unseen eyes, a feeling more harrowing than any look could be. An eerie stillness hung between us until it moved, or rather unfolded, like an origami nightmare coming undone. Stealing myself against panic, I held steady despite every survival instinct screaming resistance. Suddenly another rustle, this one behind me. Spinning around, gun drawn, another figure lurked at the edge of my vision. A man? Impossible to distinguish from shadow save for pale eyes reflecting moonlight that shouldn't be present beneath these thick boughs. Who are you? My voice cut through silence with equal parts authority and fear. Not panicked but firm a demand for answers while legs tense to flee. The figure didn't respond but melted backward into darkness, as though made from midnight itself. Realizing backup was necessary after all, I fumbled for my radio with trembling hands. Static greeted my call sign, an unwelcome reminder that help might not arrive in time. As hard hammered against ribcage like a frantic drummer gone rogue, commotion erupted from two fronts, the creature before and shadowed man behind charging with speed defying their disparate sizes. I turned and ran. The first creature, a mass of slender limbs, lurched closer. Rotten leaves broke under its weight. I glimpsed pointed teeth, mottled skin stretched over an impossible skeleton. Yet those were just fleeting impressions— my mind struggled to piece them into a coherent image. Behind me, the second pursuer, pale eyes my only hint of form, was relentless. I didn't know if it was man or shadow, but its presence spurred me on faster. My breath came in gasps, labored from exertion and fear. Attempts to radio for backup had failed. There was only crackling static. I broke into a clearing and stumbled. Glancing back, the first creature skulked at the edge of the trees but did not approach the open space. The second figure was nowhere seen. The absence of pursuit brought no relief. Instead, a cold realization settled in. Escape was not an option. The forest seemed to close in around me, and the unseen eyes I felt before returned with heightened intensity. It occurred to me then, the creature might be some undetected species, evolved to elude recognition, hunting in pairs with, what? A human accomplice? Declining to dwell on it further, I focused on survival. Movement at my feet distracted me, 
A smear of blood on a rock betrayed signs of a struggle. Someone had been hurt here before. This evidence served as a grim reminder that these were not mere chasers of thrill, but hunters capable of genuine harm. With labored breathing, I searched for shelter or some natural weapon but found nothing within reach. A crunch echoed from the woods, rapid steps. The creature appeared again from where I had first seen it now closing the distance between us much more quickly than before, and this time it didn't stop at the clearing's edge. It surged forward, a gruesome sight of an evolutionary marvel, and tackled something to the ground with a sickening snap of bone. A scream cut short followed by silence thicker than fog confirmed what I couldn't bring myself to watch. It was over in seconds. A camper paid dearly for wandering too deep into these woods. The man's face would stay with me. Even if I never knew his name, the terror etched upon it was indelibly marked in my memory as I backed away slowly towards safety. The creature didn't follow. Its attention secured on new prey gave me an unhoped chance to escape. Finally reaching civilization battered and exhausted days later, recounting the story yielded mostly skepticism but one ranger listened intently, nodding as if he understood all too well that some corners of nature harbor things beyond current understanding, things beyond our dominion. In quiet nights that followed, the memory of unseen eyes watching made sleep elusive, but life pressed on and so did I, knowing that somewhere out there was proof of an unclassified predator stalking shadowed forests, an unsolved mystery draped in moonlight's deceitful glow.